morning. Good morning, Professor Nui. How are you? Nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm just gonna share the screen here and get my <laughs> slides up. So uh, there we are. Let's see, go back to share screen. Yeah. Okay, let's go on over here. Okay, we're ready to go. Sorry, it must have been very tough for you to wake up in the morning. You you said till the end of the night. I think it's all right. I I usually get up pretty early, so it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It's been a long day for you, right? Is is this the end of the day? Kind of after. Uh, this is not the end. Uh, this is uh, this is this is around six thirty. Here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, we are ten and a half hours ahead of you. Ten, ten and a half. You said. Yeah, ten and a half. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Hi, Professor Mimi. Hi, good morning. I mean, good, good morning. morning. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, nice so, so uh, Saurav, you can begin in a minute. Yeah, yeah, I will begin. Yeah. So, excellent talk in the morning. We had uh, one of the most interactive sessions so far. <laughs> lots of questions, lots of curiosity. Lots of questions. That was good, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm guessing there will be lots of questions in the breakout right. session. Yeah, we'll session as well. yeah. So yeah, sort of uh you can start okay. the proceedings. Yeah, yeah. So there is nothing to start, Professor. <laughs> Nui has already started uh, the started uh, the econometrics part of our winter school in the morning. So he he introduced to us machine learning methods in econometrics, and uh, so uh, to uh, this session probably he will go a bit uh, bit in depth to the to a, to one paper, and in the next session probably he will go to another paper. So uh, yeah, I won't waste any more time. So Professor Nui, you can, yeah, you should begin now, yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, well, thank you again, and I look forward to uh, a good evening with you. So we'll begin. Uh, so, so the title of this lecture is Double Debiased Machine Learning, and it's basically to fix the problem that we saw at the end last time. Okay, so the bias problem, and that's what this is about. That's what the double debiased is. Double, double has to do with you need to do another machine learning estimator in order to debias, and then debiased. We're going to get rid of that problem that we found. And I think I fixed the scroll. <laughs> so oh, maybe not. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, let's see, there's a review. So having machine learning methods that give good predictions and sometimes amazing, as we know, uh, we have those and that's great. They're good for prediction. Now, in order to get these good predictions, they use regularization, such as lasso shrinkage or not iterating 
the gradient descent to convergence for neural nets. So there's various kinds of regularization that are used in, in these machine, different machine learning methods. And this leads to bias that makes plug-in estimators very biased. Uh, so in other words, the, the, the regression estimator, the machine learning estimator is itself biased. Okay, and, and uh, that bias passes through when we're trying to get a parameter we're interested in by plugging in the machine learner into some formula, okay? Uh, they often also use model selection. We didn't get a chance to talk about this much, but model selection also causes bias. And uh, this is, there's a, a well-known paper by Lieb and Posture that make this really clear. Model selection makes plug-in estimators biased when the coefficients are close to zero. And that turns out to be because the wrong model is being selected. Okay, so I don't, we don't have time to go through that, but, but you should know that model selection is also a problem. Okay, and so these bias, the plug-in estimator, the regularization, and model selection biases the plug-in estimator. Okay, so you can't just plug machine learning into some formula. So the solution to this is what we call name and orthogonal moment functions for GMM, okay? And what those are, are those are moment functions specially designed so that the first step that you're using doesn't affect the moments. Okay, at least the first order. The first, the, the, the machine learner you're plugging in doesn't affect the moments. Okay, so we're going to talk about those, what they look like, uh, how to use them, how well they work. We'll give empirical examples in this uh, talk and, uh, you know, talk about these orthogonal moments and then how you, and how they uh, eliminate the bias problem. All right, so... I guess I'm stuck still with the scrolling with my pad. Okay. The salute, right. So, so what are what are they? What are name? What's name and orthogonality? What's all that? What's that about? That's um, that's about getting rid of this bias. Okay. In a and the name and name comes from Neyman C alpha tests. Abraham Neyman developed uh, many years ago these tests that depend on nuisance parameters, but the nuisance parameters have no effect on the limiting distribution. Okay, so he set up, he set up tests where you plug in things, but they have no effect on the limiting distribution, okay? And so these are based on the score of the log likelihood. And what he did, what he did is he, he basically parceled out the effect of the first step estimation. And that's what we're gonna do in a general way. Um, and we'll talk about that. And uh, you can get orthogonal moment functions for GMM, okay, where first steps have zero effect on the average of the moment function. By first steps, I mean the the uh, things you're plugging in, you know, the machine learners you're plugging in, they have zero effect on the average of the moment function. Okay, and what that does, it, it gets rid of the first order effect. This gets rid of a first order effect. They have zero effect to first order on the average of the moment function. And what it, what, what it does, it makes the effect of regularization and model selection bias is second order. Okay, and, and as a result, you can get asked the usual root n, theta hat minus theta naught, asymptotic normal result for the parameter of interest. So theta hat's going to denote our estimator, theta naught the parameter of interest, and you get the usual result. Even though you have this big bias in machine learners, you've taken it out to first order. And as a result, the usual confidence intervals based on a consistent estimator of V will be correct. Okay, so that's, that's going to be the idea. We're going to describe a way to debias moment conditions. Okay, we're going to, in fact, it's a general way to do it. Uh, and we'll describe that. 
Now, because you're only eliminating the first order bias, and there's still second order bias asymptotically. And so uh, we ask that root n times the bias squared goes to zero. The asymptotic theory contains conditions like that. Okay. Okay. So this and um, these name and orthogonal moment conditions remove this. Uh, right. Remove the bias. Okay. So now let's go to our example one. Okay. This is where we in that graph we had the bias last time. Okay, so we're going to look at a regression where you're regressing y on d and some uh, functions of z. Uh, this is the same setup as last time. H naught of z is a linear combination of a lot of these uh, basis functions. Okay, and, and uh, we used last time an identifying moment function that led to large bias and what it looked like this this so this is the kind of common notation for gmm you have a moment function that at the true first step so gamma is going to be the first step and at the true parameter has expectation zero okay so that's kind of familiar notation for gmm okay and what this moment function looks like is it's the regressor of interest minus what's going to be our estimator of the conditional mean of the regression, regressor of interest given the covariance. Okay, and then we had this y minus theta d part. Okay, so this is our identifying moment condition. Right? This is our identifying moment condition. If you plug in the true gamma, this true uh, regression of d on the covariance, into this, then the expectation of this will be zero at the true parameter theta naught, okay? So the way we construct an estimator then is just as usual for GMM, we're gonna plug in a gamma hat, we're gonna take the sample average of this and then solve for theta. And that gives us uh, uh, the estimator, the estimator from last time. So here's zero, we're setting sample moments equal to zero. Uh, we're gonna solve for theta tilde. We're plugging in here this V. This V is just di minus gamma hat, right? So we've plugged in gamma hat here and we're solving for theta tilde, okay? And, and, and all of this can be summarized as just take the sample average of these identifying moments with the machine learner plugged in, and then you solve for theta tilde. Okay, that's the bad estimator. Okay, that's the estimator that didn't work last time for in the graphs. And we'll come back to the graphs in a bit. Okay, so the question is, what do we do about this? Um, well, it turns out there's something you can add to it that gets rid of the bias that uh, to first order makes the expected value of the new moment function not depend on gamma, okay? And it, this thing is, uh, we're gonna note, denote this as an alpha, okay? So this is the new thing we're adding. So here's the identifying moments we started with, which are right here. We're going to add to it a function of the covariance times the residual from regressing the variable of interest on the covariance. Okay, so that's the thing we're going to add. This debiases. Okay, okay, it debiases. Now um, we'll talk more about that, but uh, this debiases. And then the thing that I want to say about this is adding this doesn't change the asymptotic variance. It turns out the thing you're adding when you stick it in here in average, the thing that you're adding always converges to zero, okay? So it doesn't affect the asymptotic variance at all. Um, it converges to zero by construction, but it does uh, affect the bias and gets rid of it, okay? Now, the thing that we add is the regression of y minus d theta hat on z, the covariance, okay? 
So that's the thing that we're going to add and all, and we'll see what this leads to. And then uh, it'll be intuitive that this removes the bias. We'll see what this leads to. Should be intuitive that this removes the bias. Okay, in fact, we'll say it right now, this orthogonal moment function. Okay, so this thing here, corresponds to the first law level Robinson parceling out of functions of Z from the regression of Y on D. Okay, so let's just look at that. Let's look, look just put it all together and look at what this um, orthogonal moment function is. When you plug in the true gamma naught, remember gamma naught was the regression of the covariate of interest on the other, I mean, the variable of interest on the covariates, okay? So that's what gamma naught is right there. And then you have Y minus D theta, so that's the G part. And then we're adding this alpha and we're gonna plug in the true one, the true alpha naught. And you get D minus, you get the residual from regressing D on the covariates. And then here for the rest of it, you get uh, the residual from regressing Y on the covariates minus the residual from regressing D on the covariates times the parameter of interest. And that's exactly this law. You know, you take the res you're going to take the residual from regressing Y on the covariates and regress that on the residual from regressing D on the covariates. This is the, right, this is your regressor here. And this is your residual from regressing the Y residual on the D residual, okay? And so when we take the average of this and set it equal to zero, it's just a regression. You're gonna regress this on this, okay? So this is the dependent, the left-hand side variable. This is the regression. And then, you know, you're gonna, you've got a residual then here. And you're going to multiply that by this, the regressor. Okay, so the first order are the, you know, setting these sample moments equal to zero, that's just running a regression. Okay, and that de bias is here. Okay. okay, so next. Okay. Okay, so here it is again. Just from the previous page, we're writing out the same equations. Right here, write out the same equations. And then in words, uh, I mean, in type written down on the page, what we just said, choosing theta to solve this equal to zero, setting this moment equal to zero is ordinary least squares from a regression of the Y residual on the D residual. You know, we all, this is the thing we always do to estimate one coefficient when we have a lot of covariates. Now, Robinson looked, uh, Peter Robinson, 1988, a long time ago, looked at, looked at this in the context of non-parametric estimation, where you're going to plug in non-parametric estimators here, and very nice paper, one of the fundamental papers in the whole semi-parametric literature, um, great paper. And uh, that's the debiasing, <laughs> is to do Robinson, okay? Uh, now, it turns out this is general. There is something like this that works for everything. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit, okay? Now, you can check. One of the things you can do is check here that, in fact, and we'll focus on gamma, the gamma has no effect on the average moments. Okay, you can check that. Oh, yes, question. We'll just check that. Okay, we'll just do a little bit of, um, little bit of algebra here and a little bit of expectation calculation and you can see that. Okay, so let's, okay, so define U theta to be this, uh, this y minus d theta thing, okay? Then alpha naught of z theta was is minus the expectation of, of u theta given z. If you go back and look at the definition of alpha, it was, remember alpha was, um, was the expectation, minus the expectation of this, okay? So then what we're gonna do is uh, compare the expectation 
of the D bias moment function at any gamma with the expectation of the D bias moment function at the true gamma. Okay, now if you go back up and look at this, um, look at the moment function here. You can see that when you subtract the two moment functions, the D drops out here. Okay, so the only, the thing that's unknown here is the D. The D drops out uh, and you're left with this expectation of D given Z. And so you can write this as expectation of gamma naught. Remember that's the expectation of D given Z minus gamma. Okay, right there. And then the rest of it is you have a U theta, is when you difference this, you have U theta here and you have minus the expectation of U theta given Z here. And now the, this is zero because the delta Z is a function of Z. And this is the deviation of, of something from its conditional mean, which is always orthogonal or um, has expected product zero with any function of Z. We can write that out. You know, just the algebra gives you, when you take this difference, you get this, which is the first term is the expectation of delta Z U theta. The second term is the expectation of delta Z expectation U theta given Z, applied rated expectations for the, for the first term. Okay, you get the expectation of delta Z times the expectation of U theta given Z which is the same as the second term, so it's zero, okay? So actually, what we find is that the expected value of this uh, uh, ortho name and orthogonal moment function does not depend on gamma. <laughs> when you set theta naught, and sorry, alpha naught, alpha equal to the true value, the, the expectation doesn't depend on gamma. And so, of course, gamma has no first order effect. But in fact, there's a stronger property here. We'll come back to that later. You can check similarly that um, when you plug in the true gamma, that the expectation of this function doesn't vary with the alpha. Okay, so, so changing either one alone, gamma or alpha, doesn't affect the expectation here. Okay, so there's, what that means is that's, so that's like two partial derivatives being zero, right? So that's what we mean by no first order effect, right? The partial effects are zero, partial derivatives are zero, the expectation as it were with respect to gamma and alpha, when the other one is equal to the truth. That's, that's like zero partial derivatives. Right, <laughs> and if you have zero partial derivatives for both terms, then you have a zero derivative under you know the usual calculus conditions. So, so there's no first order effect of gamma and alpha here. Okay, okay. So that's just a little demonstration of this. Um, this has been known for a long time, actually, for this uh, debias moment function. It's actually you know, the basis of Robinson's analysis. We're gonna generalize it to anything, anything in a certain wide class, okay? All right, so let's go to the next slide. Yep, okay, so here's the orthogonal moment function again at the true, you know, at the true gamma naught. So we're plugging in the expectation of B given Z here and the true alpha knot, we're, we're plugging that into and differencing. And again, it just corresponds to a regression of the Y residual on the D residual. Okay, so, so how would you use this to do debias machine learning? You just replace these conditional means by machine learners. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do here. We're just gonna uh, replace those conditional means by machine learners and then solve for theta. Okay, we're going to, I'm sorry, then you're going to plug in, you're going to average and solve for theta. So that's the description. So we use the orthogonal moment function to estimate theta by replacing this 
the expectation of D given Z and the expectation of Y given Z by machine learnings. Anything works within, uh, as long as it has certain properties that we'll mention. Uh, you can use lasso, neural nets, or random forests. And then you regress the Y residual on the D residual. You take the machine learning residual here. Uh, you regress it on the machine learning res residual for D. That gives you a theta hat. That is your, your uh, uh, de-biased machine learning of theta, okay? And this avoids the plug-in bias. This gets rid of the plug-in bias, okay? So we're gonna look at that here in, in just a minute. Um, okay, so let me move this, this thing up to the top. Okay, so we avoid plug-in bias by estimating theta naught from a regression of the machine learning Y residual on the machine learning D residual. Okay, we're using machine learners for the conditional expectation estimators. Okay, and we're gonna do one other thing, which I'm not talking about quite yet, but will. We're gonna also use out of sample predicted values here for these things. That, that's referred to as cross-fitting, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so now let's look at that graph again. Here it is. Okay, so the left side's the bad. That's where you just plug in into that moment function we started, that identifying moment function we started, started with. Okay, and this is for random force. You're plugging in a random force estimator of the conditional mean of the variable of interest given the covariance. Okay, that one's bad. You do this one and you get rid of most of it. You get rid of most of the bias. And if you look at coverage probabilities here, they're pretty good actually. You know, the T, the t test here, you know, it, it over rejects. So it actually, because you're, <laughs> you're lowering this side and increasing this side a little bit, it doesn't over reject hardly at all. It does, there is a little bit of bias left. That's that second order thing, but it's, it, you know, the majority of it's gone and the confidence intervals are fine. Yeah. This one is the one where you partial out. Okay, you take the machine learning Y residual, you regress it on the machine learning uh, residual for D, the regressor of interest, and it works fine. Okay. All right, so that is the Okay, so that's what you do, and that's how it works, and it, it works fine. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions? This is my blank page. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think well, Pragya Sharma raised her hand. I think. If do you have a question? Oh no, it's okay. No, I think you are. You are very clear up till now, so no, no question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, hopefully that won't change too much. <laughs> okay, now there is, I said we use cross-fitting, okay? That's this, um, so I just need to describe that in the notation. Uh, so, and in fact, that this graph did that, that previous graph did cross-fitting as well. So what, Okay, so the idea is to use, when you plug in these predicted values, we're gonna use out of sample predicted values, okay? And that does two things. It removes overfitting bias, and there's a bias that you can get from uh, plugging in the predicted value on the same data. And it, and it also does amazing things for the applicability of this to a wide range of machine learners. It allows for any machine learner where you know a mean square convergence rate. This can, and uh, just for the econo any econometricians in the audience, um, it actually uh, makes the asymptotics super simple relative to the previous semi-parametric asymptotics. Um, you, all you need <laughs> is a mean square convergence, right? It gets rid of the need for what it calls stochastic equicontinuity conditions. And that's really important for machine learners because we don't know that they satisfy those. Okay. So, so for practical purposes, though, it removes another source of bias 
and for practical purposes, it allows for any, you can plug in any machine learner and get this to work as long as it's got some uh, fast enough means per convergence rate. And we'll mention what we mean by that. Okay. Okay, so what is cross-fitting? It's using a first step obtained from observations that are not being averaged over, kind of an out of sample first step. So it, it's similar to the cross validation we did. We're gonna split the sample into L groups of about equal size, L equals five or 10 typically, but I L be the observations in the L group. That's gonna be the group of observations we're averaging over. And then gamma hat L and alpha hat L would be estimated from all observations not in IL. So I could have put a minus L or minus L in here, but I, this is just the notation we've used. Okay, so these are estimated from observations not in the IL. And then for an orthogonal moment function, the cross fit sample moment functions look like this. So you take C hat of theta. It's just a sample average. It's, uh, you're gonna average across the different groups. And then for each group of observations, you average over the observations here in that group, right? Average over the observations in the group. But these, the gamma hat and alpha hat are taken from all the other observations. Okay, so the way to think about this is like if there's 10 groups, let's say 10 groups or five even, five is pretty typical. Suppose you have five groups of observations. Okay, so I'm gonna take this sample average. I'm gonna do it for each group here, L equals one to L. And within each group, I take all the observations in that 20% of, you know, the one fifth of the data. And then I, I sum across those observations here. And these are computed from the four fifths of the data, the rest of the data. Okay, so so lots of observations are being used to compute these. You're not losing, you're losing some observations, but you know, you're getting 80% of the observations in computing these. Okay. And and um, and then in this average, the, the WI here is different than the data used here. And that just that just good for bias reduction and no. Oh, great. It makes the asymptotics a lot simpler, actually. Just a ton simpler when you have different data here than you have here. And, you know, what it's doing is it gets rid of, it gets rid of everything but a mean square rate. It gets rid of all the regularity conditions for these estimates except the mean square rate. And so it's just fantastic, actually. Um, you know, it's really great. Okay. Um, okay, so we construct this CrossFit moment, and then D bias machine learning is obtained by just solving for theta here. Okay, solve for theta. Okay, so that's the CrossFit D bias machine learning. Okay. Okay, next, see if I can get to the next page. Okay, so let's do an application. Yep, let's do an application of this, and this is from the double de-bias double machine learning paper. Uh, it's based on uh, in, uh, the effect of 401k on net financial assets. And Jim Paterba, Denti, and Wise had a couple of papers on this um, in the 90s, and we're gonna redo their estimates using machine learning to estimate the effect of the covariance. Uh, okay, so they're looking at the effect of 401k eligibility. So what 401k is, um, 401k is a retirement plan that a lot of employers in the U.S. have where uh, the, the plan is that they put, they put uh, assets away, from there. they buy assets for you as part of your compensation. You know, it's kind of an employer savings plan. And... Um, the often 401k plans, there's an employer contribution. Okay, so, so the idea is, uh, um, you know, we want to look at, so Jim Paterba does public finance, right? Um, and we want to look at the effect of eligibility on, on um, 
um, on individuals, right? And we'll talk about that. Okay, the uh, okay. The author used data from the 1991 Survey of Income and Program Participation and argued that eligibility for enrolling a 401k plan in this data can be taken as exogenous after conditioning on a few observables. Okay. And then what we do here in this example is we use machine learning that allows for many observables to see whether allowing many covariates affects the results. Okay. Treatment variable D is an indicator for being uh, eligible to enroll in a 401k plan. Some companies have this, some don't. Okay. And the idea is, you know, presumably this is endogenous, right? Because whether you uh, join a company could be related to this. Let's try and get, uh, yeah, this things are okay. I'm just going to stand up and close the blind. Beautiful sunshine coming in in the morning here. Okay. Um, so it's potentially endogenous. So what they do, they argue, is that if you condition on some things, that it's plausibly exogenous. And uh, that you put covariates, you can put covariates to control for the endogeneity, that the endogeneity is an omitted variables bias problem. So what are they what? What do they use and what do we use? A vector of broad covariates acts consists of, oops, age, income, family size, years of education, a marriage indicator, a tuner, tuner status indicator, a defined benefit, pension status indicator, IRA, that's a, that's a United States um, government uh, a tax-free retirement that's available and a home and ownership indicator. Okay. So it uh, turns out this matters. The estimated, you know, putting in this cover, it matters. The estimated effect of 401k eligibility on net financial assets. So that's the outcome variable. We want to see how it affects savings. If you have a 401k, it's $19,559 with an estimated standard error of 1413 when no control variables are used. And the effect is substantially attenuated when we allow for covariance. Okay, so let's just look at the tables here. Okay, so I'm gonna put the risk, some risk of um, going back to this. I'm just gonna expand this so that you can see it. Okay, so what we have here is this uh, uh, CrossFit debiased machine learner. And look at this, actually, we're gonna look for now, we're gonna look at this part B of this table. Okay, and this is, what this is, is this is the estimator you get, the estimate that you get of the effect of 401k, financial assets with lots of covariance okay um and we put in you know we put in um these those variables i said we put in uh, lots of interactions um and so there are you know many variables here uh many many covariance um the the details are uh in the paper the device machine learning paper the covariates we put in and what you get, and then, and then what's at the top are the various machine learning methods we used. So I've only talked about lasso, random forest, neural nets. Okay, there's something called boosting that was also tried. Uh, regression trees, that's uh, kind of a cruder form of random forest. Um, and then ensemble uh, is something where you, you computed all of them <laughs> and then uh, combined them. Uh, and best was where you combine them by uh, using the best fitting one. Okay. Uh, uh, again, we're doing cross fitting, so you can measure fit outside. And so th that's what the best is. You can see it doesn't matter much, actually, right? So the standard error is around one, you know, one, one, three, five, something like that, one, three, five, oh across a wide range of these things. 
And the coefficients, they only vary. Lasso is a little bit of an outlier, which is interesting. Looks like maybe there's still some second order shrinkage going on there. You know, the coefficient looks like maybe it's shrunk towards zero a little bit. The others, you don't see any of that. They're all in the upper 80s or low 90s. Uh, sorry, upper 8,000s or low 9,000s. Okay. And so the results are not very sensitive to the machine learning. Okay. So once you've debiased, uh, you know, once you've done this debiasing, you get pretty similar results from using different machine learning methods. Okay. And so that's the takeaway from this. And it is, uh, it's not actually ends up not being super different than what uh, Paterba and his co-authors found. Okay. It's a little different. It does make some uh, effect, but it does have some effect, but not a huge amount. Okay, so that's an application. Okay, and you find that the machine, you know, once you once you've done the debiasing, uh, what machine learning you do doesn't matter that much. Now, if you we don't have in the table what you get if you don't do the debiasing, and uh, there it does matter, which is things have, and actually, you know, you know, you're getting something that's wrong for a lot of these things. Um, so I don't really want to talk about it. That's why we didn't put it in the table um, because we know it's wrong. And so, uh, you know, when you do debias, you get pretty similar estimates. Okay, I'm coming back to panel A. <laughs> Before we're done with this, with this discussion, I'll be back. We'll be back there. Okay. Any. Let's see, let me keep going here for a minute and let's see if anybody have any questions we could stop now. Okay. All right, so we're gonna summarize what we've done so far. I mean, actually what I wanna do right is get the full view back. Full screen mode. There we go. Okay, so let's just summarize what we've done so far. Okay, so this is kind of a summary, general summary, but also kind of generalization. You have a parameter of interest theta. It's identified by a moment condition. Okay, this gamma represents some first step, some regression we're going to think about today, actually. You can do the same thing for first steps, but a regression. And then the theta is the unique value of the parameter of interest that solves this moment equation. Just GMM, GMM was some first step, okay? Gamma naught is the PLIM, probability limit of some first step machine learner, such as a conditional mean, okay? Then to get a name and orthogonal moment condition, what you do is you're gonna add something to this, okay? The something you add is not going to affect the asymptotic distribution. It's not going to affect the variance. The sample average of this will be a non-parametric estimator of zero. So it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything to either the identification. It doesn't affect identification. It doesn't affect the asymptotic variance, but it debiases. It, it adding this thing um, makes the expected value of this the bias moment function have zero derivative with respect to gamma at the true alpha. Now, there is another thing that shows up when you add this, always. In all the cases we know of, except one or two maybe, there's another function that shows up, but that's the cost of debiasing. You also have to estimate this alpha. And uh, the last lecture, we're gonna talk about how to do that in general, okay? Alpha is another unknown function in addition to the gamma. Okay, so what does this fee look like? Well, uh, there is a general formula for it. Um, it's uh, You can characterize it in a way that allows you to figure out what it is. I actually uh, worked on this a long time ago uh, from this paper, Asymptotic Variance of Semi-Parametric Estimators. This fee is the adjustment term which adjusts for the presence of the presence of the non-parametric gamma here. Okay, there in this uh, 
you know, it's it's kind of <laughs> you're doing a, a an adjustment for the fact you're plugging in an estimate, and that's what this is. Okay, it's that it's the thing that actually the I won't say anyway. It's this adjustment term from this earlier paper. Okay. Now, a simpler formula for this gamma than in the earlier paper is given in this later paper, which uh, the locally robust semi-parametric estimation paper is all about this thing. A simpler formula for it in terms of what's called influence functions are given in this paper. And it's quite general. In fact, uh, what you can show is that as long as you know, solving this for given for, you know, a first step estimator here, is going to produce a read in consistent estimator of theta, then this thing exists. This just existence of this thing just depends on essentially on uh, a read in, how, getting a read in consistent estimator from plugging in this um, machine learning here uh, for gamma and then solving for theta. Okay. So, so it's quite general. Uh, this paper does the general case and um, shows that it actually produces this orthogonality property when you add this. Okay, you can devise machine. Anyway, yeah, let me just leave it at that. There's more, you know, there's lots in the, this paper, <laughs> this local robust paper about this including the relationship to various things in the statistics literature about de-biased machine learning involving um, efficient scores and things. So that's that the relationship of this thing with what's in the stat literature is laid out in a lot of detail in this paper. That's forthcoming in a comment. Okay. Okay, so now, okay, so that's the orthogonal moment condensed. Function. So once we've got it, we just do the cross fitting. As you said, been done perhaps. I mean, we actually have to compute these things. But hey, we have fast computers, right? And uh, you can do that if you've got a nice algorithm for this. It's straightforward to do. Uh, you you uh, then do this cross fitting to create cross fit debiased moments. Okay. And then you get the debiased GMM estimator by either solving this equation in the exactly identified case, or as usual for GMM, you minimize a quadratic form where these are the moment functions. The CrossFit sample averages of the um, of the um, moment functions, where you you know you estimate the gamma and the alpha from different observations than you're averaging over and and do GMM. Okay. Now by virtue of the fact that you've gotten rid of the first order effect, you don't have to worry anymore any in the standard areas for estimation of these things. Okay. You've gotten rid of the first order effect of gamma and also of alpha. And so you you can treat this as if in doing standard errors, you can treat this thing as if gamma hat was equal to the truth and alpha hat was equal to the truth for the standard errors. So, right, I mean, that's kind of one of the virtues of this. You don't have to worry about two-step standard errors, okay? Once you've got the orthogonal moments, you just treat this as if it's not, as if gamma and alpha are known, and that gives the right standard errors, okay? Because machine learning is quite complicated, we haven't started to worry about the higher order properties of that yet. Um, uh, but the, but and presumably you might worry about these standard errors because they've got these high dimensional things in them, but they work reasonably well in Monte Carlo uh, examples um, that we've looked at, and so um, there's. And so, you know, it seems to work actually. You plug in these machine learners to get. Uh, an estimate, uh, you know, an estimated moment function. <laughs> and then you just treat it as if these uh, gamma hat and the alpha hat are known for the standard errors and everything's fine. Right. So you estimate the asymptotic variance in the usual way while ignoring the fact that gamma hat and alpha hat are estimated. Okay. 
So that's it. You know, once you got so it's all solved. <laughs> right. Let me go back. You got this orthogonal moment function. Okay. And you do cross fitting in the to construct sample moments, and then you just do GMM. Okay. And that the locally robust paper is all about this. That's that's what the subject is for, to in general. Now, of course, we haven't said, I mean, the gamma hat comes from somewhere. It's a regression, say. And you do have this alpha hat that shows up all of a sudden. You know, when you do the, you know, it turns out it's important for the debiasing. Um, we have a method of estimating alpha that only works off this, that only uses this. You don't even have to know what the form of alpha is. That's the subject of the last lecture, the third lecture, okay? Um, so we do have a way to estimate alpha. Okay, so there's one question in chat. Okay, let me look at it. The void endogeny, right. Yes, that's right. What if D is endogenous to the simultaneity? Uh, yes, you could. This approach would work when excluded instruments are present. Right. Uh, that's a great point. Um, you could do an IV version of this. That's a great point. Let's just go back and look at the empirical application, actually. Uh, some risk here. <laughs> I'll be fine. Okay, let's go back and look at the. Right. Absolutely. Totally. Right, so we don't really, well, it's this model, right? It's a regression model. So let's go back and look at it. Yeah, it's why. So here, you're using the regressor, sorry. Right? I mean, here in this orthogonal moment function, you're using the regressor, right? And what the comment was is great comment. If you had endogeneity, you could just put an instrument in here and then do the same thing to get rid of the. The, the included exogenous variables are the included covariates. Yeah, and in fact, that gives you a version of local average treatment effects with covariates. It's not, does it? Uh, it's close to it. But you can think, let's just think of IV for now. Put an instrument here instead of D in this part, right? And, and then you estimate the effect of included covariates by machine learning here and here and here and you would you would have the instrument here minus the residual i'm sorry minus the regression of the instrument on the covariates and here you would have the same thing we had before okay and absolutely um good point you could do iv for this where you use machine learning to control for a lot of covariates absolutely and it works. It, it works quite well, actually. I think Josh does this in the machine labor paper. I'm not, I'm not sure. He at least does the regression thing. Okay. And does a nice application of it. Okay, another question. Oh, thanks. Okay, very good. All right. Um, okay, so now let's go on to, oops. I'm going backwards apparently. And we did that, did that. Okay, so what I'd like to do for the rest of the time actually is look at the average treatment effect and how you do this for the average treatment effect. So, you know, we're, we, the first example was one coefficient in a regression where you have a lot of other regressions, high dimensional. So, so that's fine. Uh, we do, uh, you know, we do a lot of regression, most of what we do, but we also have become interested in other things, um, especially over the, you know, the credibility revolution in applied micro. Uh, we have become very interested in treatment effects and how you estimate um, various kinds of treatment effects. So you can apply this to estimating the average treatment effect under the conditional independence assumption. So, you know, as in mastering metrics or mostly harmless econometrics, you know, where you 
condition on cover is to control for indulgence. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna focus on, on that for the next little bit, actually. Okay. Um, all right, so just, I'm, many of you are familiar with this notation, but I'm just gonna introduce, for those of you who don't know, I'm uh, gonna introduce the potential outcomes notation and give a brief, brief uh, discussion of the average treatment effect and then get to estimation here in a few pages, okay? So treatment effect is how some outcome of interest such as earnings is affected by some treatment. So I think probably everybody knows this, but still, I think we're gonna, just for review sake, just in case, don't wanna lose anybody. So let D denote a, treat, a treatment effect is how some outcome of interest such as earnings is affected by some treatment such as a job training program, okay? And let's switch back here, um, okay? For example, so what D denote the treatment indicator, it's equal to one if treated and zero otherwise. D might correspond to enrollment in some training program, some medical treatment, or you know, could correspond to whether you're eligible for a 401k, uh, some retirement program of an employer. Okay, and so then the key, key, uh, a key element of this model but Y1 is the outcomes with and without treatment. Y1 the outcome with treatment. Y0 outcome without treatment. I'm sorry, that should say without. Um, y1 is the outcome with treatment. Y0 the outcome without treatment. And then the observed outcome is that you're looking at is if, if you're treated, so D is one, you get the outcome with treatment. And if you're not treated, so the, uh, one minus D is one, you get the outcome without treatment. And then the, you know, the, a key feature of this model is that only one of Y0 and Y1 is observed. The other is counterfactual, i.e. what would have happened in the other treatment case, okay? The treatment effect for an individual is Y1 minus Y0, and this is never observed. You know, because all you observe for one individual is whether you have Y1 or Y0. So you never observe this for any individual. Okay. And so it's not identified. Okay. Um, you can, under some conditions, identify the average treatment effect. And we're going to focus on that. And so our parameter of interest now is going to be the expectation of the treatment effect. Okay, so the expected difference of Y1 minus Y0. And you can identify this under some assumptions. Okay, so we are going to, oops, by the way, we're going to look at the conditional independence assumption. Okay. The conditional independence assumption is that there are observed covariates Z such that the potential outcomes are mean independent of treatment conditioned on these covariates. Okay, so the way we would write that mathematically is we say the expectation of Y1 given D and Z, given the treatment and the covariates only depends on the covariates. Okay, so once you condition on Z, uh, the outcome without treatment no longer depends on D. Okay, the expected value of it no longer depends on D. And, and I'm sorry, that should be Y1. Oops, that's Y1. Expectation of Y1 given D and Z is expectation of Y1 given Z. Expectation of Y0 given D and Z is uh, expectation of Y0 given just Z. So we say the potential outcomes are mean independent of treatment, conditional on covariance. Okay, and so this is, um, um, if you don't have something like this, you get endogeneity from regressing Y on D. Okay, and this gets rid of that kind of endogeneity. As, the, as in the chat, this is getting rid of endogeneity by including uh, covariates, including variables. Okay, so 
what conditional independence gives you is the following. If you look now at um, conditional means that you can get from the data. Okay, so this is the conditional mean of Y, conditional on the covariance and treated, being treated. This is the conditional mean of the outcome conditioned on not being treated in the covariance. By virtue of the fact that D is one, you know, this is the treated individuals. For those, tre for those individuals, the outcome variable is Y1. And so we can just put in Y1 here, okay? For D equals one, Y is Y1. So we just put it in. And for D equals zero, I'm sorry, yeah, Y is Y1. For D equals zero, Y is Y0, right? Okay, so we're just, that's just substituting for what y is under d equals one and what y is under d equals zero, okay? Now, we've assumed that this doesn't depend on d, that d drops out here, okay? So this is for both d's, d equal one, you get this, d equals zero, you get this, right? Okay, so for d equals one, d drops out. Okay, so expectation of Y1 given D equals one and Z is just the expectation of Y1 given Z. Similarly, the expectation of Y0 given D equals zero and Z is just the expectation of Y0 given Z. And now you have a difference of the same conditional expectation of two different variables, right? And the, right, the expectation, uh, sorry, the difference of expectations is the expectations of the difference. This observable thing that you can estimate here is actually the expected treatment effect, the average treatment effect conditioned on the covariance. Okay. All right. Um, so that means this conditional average treatment effect, the, the average treatment effect conditioned on Z is identified for all Z such that you have both of these. What you need is for, if as long as you have some D equal ones for Z and some D equal zeros, both of these, you can get both of these from the data. And then the conditional independence delivers the conditional average treatment effect, okay? All right, so, the conditional average treatment effect given Z is identified for all Z such that both D equals one and D equals zero are observed with positive probability. That is for all Z where this probability that D equals one given Z is greater than zero, right? So that you observe, so that you observe some ones and less than one so that you observe some zeros. If you, you know, if for some Z there are no ones, then this, you're not gonna get this from the data. Similarly, if for some Z there are no zeros, you're not gonna get this from the data. You need both of these, okay, to get to, get to the conditional average treatment effect, okay? This, uh, this identification condition has a name, it's called the overlap condition. And this conditional probability, the probability that D equals one given Z, that has a name too, it's called the propensity score. And the identification condition for the average treatment effect at a particular Z is that the propensity score is uh, greater than zero and less than one, okay? So, there's a, okay, so that's the uh, uh, conditional average treatment effect. We're actually going for the average treatment effect, but we know we can use iterated expectations, right, to get to that. If we've got a conditional average treatment effect, we can hopefully use iterated expectations, and, the, and we can. You just take the expectation of this, right? Take the expectation of this over Z, That'll be the expectation of this over Z and by iterated expectations, that's the average treatment effect. Now to get that, oops, to get that, you need the overlap condition to hold for all Zs. You need both Ds and uh, D equal one and D equal zero for every Z. 
to, to, for this to work. And if you have that condition, um, then iterated expectations gives you that the average treatment effect is the expected value of the difference of the conditional mean of y given d equal one and z and the conditional mean of y given d equal zero and z. Okay, so the, the average treatment effect is this expected value of difference of conditional means at d equal one and d equal zero. Okay, so that's a full, full, the full argument for how you get the average treatment effect uh, in the, under conditional independence and the identification condition and really a full uh, description of that. Okay. All right. Okay, so for our purposes, device machine learning, we have now a nice formula for the parameter we're interested in in terms of what? In terms of regressions. One regression, actually. We have the regression of y on d and x. Okay. And we have this nice formula for the average treatment effect as a function of that regression. Under the identification condition, the, the overlap condition is satisfied for all z. You have this nice formula for the average treatment effect. So this gives us an identifying moment function, right? And if you, in terms of a regression, you can identify theta from this. You're just going to take gamma at one and z, subtract off gamma at zero and z, subtract off theta, and that's an identifying moment function. Okay, so let's, I think that's what's on the next page. We're going to go all the way to the orthogonal moment function. <laughs> yeah. Oops, sorry. I don't want to do that. No. Uh, let me just close that and go. Sorry about that. And I moved it. Yeah, so we're going to go all the way to save a little bit of time. We're going to go all the way to the orthogonal moment function here. Okay, so here's the identifying moment function I talked about, right? So that we talked about. So you got gamma 1z minus gamma 0z minus theta. The expectation of that is zero at the true gamma and the true theta. That's what the previous equation said. Okay, down here, that's what this previous equation said. Okay, so that's the identifying moment function. Turns out that the debiasing term is the product of some function of x and the residual from the regression. Okay, so that's going to be the orthogonal moment function. Just to save time, we'll do it in one step. Write down the orthogonal moment function. Here's the identifying moment function. Here's the bias correction term here. And the true alpha naught, the true alpha is this thing. It's the ratio of the Treatment indicator to the propensity score minus the ratio of one minus the treatment indicator to one minus the propensity score. Okay. This orthogonal moment function was first given in a paper by Robbins, Jenny Robbins, Andrew Ratnitsky, and Zhao in 1995 in JASA. Okay. It's first given there. And uh, it does produce an orthogonal moment function here. Okay, and, and so actually we'll demonstrate that. Okay, so so we're just writing down the orthogonal moment. Here's the identifying moment function. Here's the bias correction or the adjustment term. Okay, and this uh, this citation is this is a JASA paper, Journal of the American Statistical Association paper from 1995. It can also be found in uh, Jim Hahn's 1998 econometric paper. It's also there. And that's, he's got a good exposition of it. It's probably easier to read, actually. There's uh, Jin Han's uh, Han 1998 economy. Okay, so let's just actually show that this is orthogonal. Okay, just to, just to, uh, just to why, why are we gonna do this? Well, you know, the orthogonality is the key property that's gonna make this work for machine learning. You know, what we're gonna do, is we're going to get a machine learner of um, gamma, the conditional mean of y given 
a D and Z. We're going to do that, use a, some regression, machine learner regression to estimate that. And then we're going to do the same thing, use a machine learner to estimate alpha. And then we're going to do debiased machine learning of the average treatment effect using this uh, orthogonal moment function. So we'll describe that in a couple of minutes here. Um, okay. Okay, so let's just show that this is orthogonal. To do that, you use this, this um, calculation, which um, is very helpful and um, is really common, shows up all, the, all over the place in treatment effect calculations, okay? Turns out that if you look, let's start at the end. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you look at this expected value, right? This is the this is the thing that you're going to get here when you take the expected value. You're going to get there the expected value of gamma one and z. Turns out that that can be written as the expectation of this first term in alpha times just the gamma. And what's going on is. Um, one way to think about it is the way to get to an expectation where you're evaluating it at d equals one is you take the function as a function of both d and z and you multiply by d and divide by p. Multiplying by d gets the one here. You know, you're gonna multiply by d, so only the one's gonna show up. When, when d is zero, you get zero in x, right? That's not there the dummy knocks that out and then you divide by p naught in order to normalize this so this is like on you know the expectation of this ratio is one so it's kind of like a weight this is kind of a weight and multiplying by this weight uh, takes the regression at at any regressor value and and sticks in a one okay well this is like getting the treated observations Okay, multiplying by this weight gives you the treated observations, and you're dividing by p zero, so uh, it's just a weight. Okay, so let's just go through that expectation of d over p zero of gamma. Since since d is zero for I mean, since d is zero, obviously for d equals zero, the only thing that shows up here is when uh, d is one. Okay, and then. Now, now this is a function only of z, so you can apply iterated expectations here. You know, this is a take uh, expectation of this conditioned on z, right? Uh, expectation of expectation of d given z over p zero. Now this is just one, and you've got expectation of gamma one. Okay, so this this thing <laughs> just. Um, maps gamma of x into gamma of one. It's a weight that, that uh, gets you that. Okay, and similarly, this does the same for zero. One minus d over one minus p zero, that gives you gamma of zero. Okay, so it follows from this that if you take the expected difference here, we work backwards, right? And take the expected Gamma one z, that's here. Well, that's this times gamma. Expectation of this times gamma. Expected value of gamma zero z, well, that's this times gamma. And then that's just the two parts of this alpha. So the expectation of gamma one of z minus gamma zero of z is the expectation of alpha zero of x times gamma of x. Okay, and so you get this interesting representation of the thing that, that you're interested in, the average treatment effect thing, in terms of the expected outer product of a function of all the x's times gamma. And that's true for any gamma. This doesn't depend on this being a, a regression or anything. This is true for any function of x. Okay, and this is, this is a key feature here that extends to many, many other things. And we'll talk about that uh, in the third, the third uh, lecture. Okay. So the point of this is once we get there, we can go immediately to the orthogonality. This gives you the orthogonality. 
Okay, so now to get the orthogonality, let's look at the expectation of this orthogonal moment function evaluated at the true alpha naught and any gamma. Okay, so here's the orthogonal moment function up here. Okay, okay so we're going to take the expectation of this. That's the first term is the expectation of this. And we just saw here that for any gamma, the expectation of this is the expectation of alpha naught times gamma. So there it is. The expectation of this first term here, expectation of alpha naught gamma right there. And then we subtract off the theta from here. And then we're plugging in the true alpha naught. So when we take, take the expectation of this, this term, it's expectation of alpha naught x times y minus gamma. And we're already there, actually. If you look at, here's, a, here's an expectation of alpha naught times gamma here. Here's minus expectation of alpha naught times gamma. Those two terms cancel, gamma disappears. Voila, <laughs> right? Gamma disappears from this. And so actually gamma doesn't have any effect on it. So we're already there. I mean, we can write it out. Uh, um, we have here, um, Right, we just cancel out, and the next step just cancels this with the second term, and gamma is gone. Right, so there's no effect of this on gamma. It doesn't really matter what this is. <laughs> doesn't really matter what this is. I put in that you know this is uh, a gamma naught here, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, gamma's gone here, and so you have orthogonality. The first order effect of gamma on these orthogonal moment functions, the expectation of the orthogonal moment function is zero. You're done. It's orthogonal. And you can, okay. So, so that's a simple proof of orthogonality here for these moment functions. This has a general structure that is true for a lot. All of these regression problems actually look like this. Um, and I'll, we'll come, we'll talk about that in the next uh, lecture. Okay. okay, so also by iterated expectations, you could go back and show that if you plug in the true gamma naught here, you uh, also, this has expectation zero. Uh, it doesn't depend on theta. Uh, and that's not quite true. Actually, anyway, it doesn't depend on alpha. Sorry, this doesn't depend on alpha. This does not depend on alpha here. You can show that. Okay, so now this is an interesting uh, feature of this problem. Notice if we go back to, if you go back to this, when theta naught is, e when theta is equal to theta naught, you get zero here. And that says that the expectation of the orthogonal moment function evaluated at the true theta naught and any gamma is zero, okay? And this, the next page says, this should be theta naught here. Expectation of uh, at gamma naught and any alpha is zero. And that's a property that's called double robustness. Okay. The expectation of this orthogonal moment function at the true parameter and any gamma is zero. Okay. And the expectation of this orthogonal moment function at the true gamma and the true theta is zero for all alpha. So for, for any gamma, you still have expectation zero, as long as you just vary gamma. And for any, X, for any alpha, you still have expectation zero. This is a now uh, quite um, famous property called double robustness, which shows up here. This is a doubly robust estimator. Uh, this is going to lead to a doubly robust estimator of the average treatment effect where it's consistent as long as either your uh, gamma hat's consistent or your alpha hat's consistent. Okay. The moment condition holds if either gamma or alpha is incorrect. If one of them is incorrect, the moment condition still holds. And it's a very nice property. And there's been lots of papers on double robustness since then and looking at uh, double robust estimating equations.
And of course, a doubly robust estimating equation is worth out on. Well, obviously, if changing any one of them, if changing one of gamma or alpha doesn't affect things, that means that the partial derivative with respect to gamma or alpha is, and alpha is zero. And that's orthogonality. Turns out, uh, one of the, another result from this locally robust paper is that in fact, any orthogonal moment function that is linear in a uh, gamma is double robust. So that's one way to think about double robustness. When do you get it? You get it when you have an orthogonal moment function. The orthogonal moment function is linear in gamma. Okay. And when it's not, you don't get double robustness. Okay. So anyway, there's this cool double robustness thing that you get here for these uh, for these uh, this moment condition. Okay. So now you know all that you need to know about double robustness. <laughs> Lots of applications of it. Uh, there's actually things called multiple robustness. Um, and anyway, um, so that's a nice feature of this average treatment effect. Okay, so back to the bias machine learning. How do we do it? Well, we have an orthogonal moment condition, right? We let's go back. Here's our orthogonal, oops, sorry. Here's our orthogonal moment function right here at the top, right here. Here's our orthogonal moment function. So we're going to plug in machine learners for gamma there. We'll plug in a machine learner there. We'll plug in a machine learner for alpha. And we'll solve the moment conditions. And that's just going to produce theta hat as a sample average of gamma hat one of z minus gamma hat zero of z plus alpha hat times y minus gamma hat of x. Okay. So here, here it is. There it is. Okay. There's the double debiased machine learner of the average treatment effect. Okay, you you um, plug in gamma hat uh, one and zi minus gamma hat zero of zi, and then you also add to it uh, the alpha hat times yi minus the gamma hat. Okay, okay, so that's it. Uh, that's it. Now we do have to say what alpha hat looks like. We haven't said what that looks like. Um, we're going to just use, uh, for now, we're going to do something different next time, but for now, we're just going to use this. We're going to take, we're going to, we have a formula, right, in terms of the propensity score. So we use some machine learner of this propensity score, okay? Um, you know, you can think about uh, anything you want, actually, here, a machine learner, um, and uh, of the propensity score, and then take uh, D divided by the machine learner of the propensity score and one minus D divided by the one minus the machine learner of the propensity score. And that's our alpha hat. We plug that in there. And then you get a debiased machine learner of the average treatment effect. Okay. And you can use anything here for the gamma hat. You can use uh, lasso, neural nets, um, random forest. That's fine. Same for the P hat. Okay. And that gives you a debiased machine learner, the asymptotic variance of that, an estimate of the asymptotic variance of root n theta hat minus theta naught is just the sample second moment of uh, this minus the two, minus its sample mean, right? So just the usual formula, ignoring the estimation of the, the gamma and the alpha, okay? And so uh, that's a general debiased machine learner of the average treatment effect, okay? Now, Farrell, very nice uh, pioneering paper on this, uh, uh, did this for lasso, okay? And used a, a, a lasso, logit lasso estimator of the, of the propensity score, okay? Very nice paper, um, okay? All right, so that's how you do it. That's how you do the average treatment effect.
Diagonal moment function, you plug in machine learners, you uh, get theta hat, okay? So let's do an application. Uh, let's see, that's it. Okay, here's the application. Uh, and it's just the first one. <laughs> okay, in this table, let me uh, escape. Expand, actually, it looks pretty good. Oops, no, 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 no. Sorry about apologies. There we go, here's the table again. And it's actually just the first panel. Okay, and what you find is that when you actually estimate the average treatment effect rather than theta, this partial linear regression coefficient, you got a little smaller. Not much and not not um, not much and not much more than the standard error. So actually here, the average treatment effect itself appears to be about the same as, as this regression coefficient. So that's kind of interesting. But maybe you can get the average treatment effect close to it in a regression here. Uh, but you also find you don't, again, the similar pattern, you know, these, these uh, now you're closer to 8,000 rather than nine. Okay, and so that reflects a difference between actually estimating the average treatment effect. The thing that you estimate here is not the ad average treatment effect. This is a unfortunate feature. We shouldn't have done this in the paper, probably. It's actually the regression coefficient. Here you're close to nine, and here you're close to eight. But again, across a wide variety of different machine learners, you get pretty similar estimates. Okay, so that is. Um, that is uh, debiased machine learning. This this is debiased machine learning. This is kind of a what we did today covers a lot of what's in that uh, econometrics journal paper. Okay, this is uh, 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 you get an orthogonal moment function. Um, you plug in machine learners into it. Uh, you do cross fitting, and then you solve for theta, and that gives you your debiased machine learning. Okay. Any questions? I think let's see. We have a sum, we're gonna sum up, but any questions on this? Sorry. I'll Okay. Is there any questions? Okay, it's all right. So I'll just sum up then. And if anybody, I'll stop at the end too for any, see if there's any questions. Okay, so let me, let's look at, um, look at full view. Where is it? View, full screen mode, there we go. Okay, so the first two lectures, what we've done is we've motivated the use of machine learning for estimating econometric models. We described some machine learning methods. We've explained the problems with the plugin. You know, if you have a machine learning method, you can't just take it and plug into some formula and expect to get a good estimate. That, it doesn't, that doesn't work because of all the regularization and model selection. Okay, and then we've shown how to do debiased machine learning for regression slope and the average treatment effect. So that's like, you know, if you think of leading applications, regression is probably the most uh, important one. And then, you know, average treatment effect, that's another very important one. And we've shown how to do it. Okay, so you can, uh, after today, you can walk away knowing how to do it. There's software for this for implementing the uh, the, uh, the estimators that we uh, talked about today, their software that uh, you can use as a package. And um, we've given Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo results, which show the importance of debiasing, and then some empirical illustrations. Okay, next time, <coughs> we kind of left as unresolved how you get alpha in general, how you do the debiasing in general. And we're going to show how to solve that next time. The, this approach can be deployed using machine learning to estimate a wide variety of important causal and structural parameters and do it automatically in the sense that you 
can get an alpha hat without knowing what alpha is even. You just need to know what you're interested in. And so that's that's the, what we'll talk about next time. The, we'll talk about next time the automatic de-bias machine learning paper. Okay, great. Any other, any questions? Uh, any questions from the audience? We have about three minutes. Uh, oh, three. A question. <laughs> there, is, there is a comment uh, praising yes. the simplicity of the method. Is there a caveat? Oh, great question. Simplicity of the method almost too good to be true. The caveat is what are the caveats? Okay, good question. Well, it's, you know, uh, these, uh, the caveats are, um, well, for the method that I gave, one caveat, one of the challenges with the average treatment effect is uh, you have this uh, thing you're doing by machine learning in the denominator. <laughs> okay. We'll fix that next time. <laughs> we'll get rid of that feature the next time. So, so that gets rid of that caveat. Um, what else? Well, it's high dimensional. So these first, these regressions are high dimensional. And so you might think there's a lot of noise and uh, there can be actually. Um, so um, another caveat, it would be computation for some of the machine learners. You know, it's fine. I put up a table. I showed that all of these machine learning estimates gave, were about the same. Neural nets is a little more challenging. You have to kind of uh, tweak that a little bit. As you saw last time, the, the neural net estimator is a, is a nonlinear, at least highly nonlinear, least squares estimator. And so automating that is not so easy. <laughs> So that's one of the caveats, is doing, doing neural nets is a little bit challenging. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, just the variability of these things. We don't know much about their second properties. You know, the, the Monte Carlos are promising. The initial empirical results are promising. Presumably the variability, it, it depends on how variable and how how good the first step is, you know, how good an estimate you get. And we're just at the beginnings. Noise due to overfitting. Um, um, you could have that. Most, I mean, these machine learning methods are designed to control for overfitting, for, for forecasting, right? Noise due to overfitting from forecasting. The crossfitting is designed to take care of that. Okay, so you could have that overfitting problem. The crossfitting is designed to take care of that. Okay, and so that's the crossfitting is is meant to help with that and does in terms of the properties of the family of interest. Great question. Great question. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think questions are coming uh, coming up to the minds of audience as it progresses, but we will stop here because it's eight already. Uh, we will take questions in the breakup session. Eight. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Talk to you later.
Once again, <coughs> welcome everyone. Welcome, Professor uh, Nimi. So, yeah. uh, uh, Professor Surinder is also here. He is going to chair the session. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So, Professor Nimi, you may start. So, thanks a lot. Maybe in, uh, maybe in two minutes. We start at eight yeah. thirty. Yes, we have two or three minutes in there. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah thanks. So, sure. I'll wait. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so welcome to this third session and ground rules will be the same as earlier two sessions. This clarificatory questions we may put in between also, but substantial questions may take at the end and the participants may write their questions in the chat box or in the end we may, they may ask you the question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, oh, that's okay. right. So over to you, President. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is uh, the third one, the third uh, meeting, and uh, this one called Automatic Debias Machine Learning of Causal and Structural Effects, okay? So uh, just to kind of pick up where we left off, um, you know, the first two lectures, they motivated the use of machine learning for estimating econometric models. They described some machine learning methods and explained the problems with just plugging in a machine learner into some formula of interest. And then we showed how to do debiased machine learning for a regression slope and the average treatment effect and gave Monte Carlo and empirical applications. And so what we're gonna do now is is make that much more widely available for estimating lots of different things and um, and we'll explain what those things are and then also uh, we're going to solve kind of an unsolved problem from before uh, before there's uh, how to get you know the unsolved problem is how to get the debiasing term 
and we'll show give a general way of uh, of doing that in this uh, in this talk. Okay, and apply it to some things. Okay, so so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, this is going to look more like a, a seminar a little bit. Um, I'm going to focus again on the implementation and on the empirical examples, and not so much about the uh, chronometric theory. I'm happy to talk about that in the breakout if anybody wants to. I have some slides, you know, I could even share that gives the theoretical results. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on the implementation. If you have questions about this, I mean, I'm happy to talk about the theory, but but. Um, I'm going to focus on the implementation and what you actually do. <laughs> um, okay, so switching, you know, switching the kind of notation a little bit. It's a little bigger and a little faster. So many interesting objects depend on a regression, and we've seen two examples of these. Uh, the single coefficient of a of a regression, uh, like we call it a partially linear model, you have a lot of covariates and you're interested in one coefficient. Okay, we did that. That was example one, actually. Example two in the previous lecture, that was the average treatment effect. Okay, we did that. There are many other objects that we're interested in that depend on a regression. You could just go on for pages about this. Another one is an average derivative. So example two is the average treatment effect when treatment is binary. You can think about an average treatment effect of some kind when treatment is continuous. And I'm gonna talk about that example in example three. This leads to a kind of average derivative of the average structural function or of the dose response function. Okay, so that's gonna be example three and we'll talk about that. But there are many, many other examples. Average treatment effect on the treated. Um, there are, for estimating economic structural models, you can use these things to do that. Like um, for estimating a dynamic discrete choice model using estimates of conditional choice probabilities. Those are, those are regressions. You can think of those conditional choice probabilities as a kind of regression. And so you can apply this to that as well. Um, okay, so many interesting objects depend on the regression. So what we're going to do, let's see, so um, all of these, all of the debiasing, excuse me, let's see. My finger is going the right direction. What we're going to do here is we're going to um, for all of these things, there's going to be a common form for the orthogonal moment function. So we're going to write down a set of orthogonal moment functions for different kinds of thetas, basically. And what we're going to do before, you know, uh, gamma is a regression before, before we had this alpha that showed up. It's kind of an extra function you have to estimate. And what we're going to do is give a lasso minimum distance estimator of alpha that's automatic and, this, and depending only on the identifying moment function and not on the form of alpha. So the est estimator we're going to give, you don't even need to know what alpha is in order to estimate it, in order to be biased. Okay, and so it, it has this automatic, we like to call it automatic for that reason. You don't need to know what alpha is, the true alpha is. Um, you can be biased without knowing it. And what, what we do is we use the structure of the identifying moment function to approximate alpha as a linear combination of a dictionary or a basis of known functions. Okay, and that kind of leads in the machine learning setting, that kind of leads to a lasso learner of alpha hat. It's uh, not lasso regression, it's something a little different. Okay, and that's what we're going to propose and give. And then you can use, you can combine this with any regression learner in your orthogonal moment functions to construct an automatic device machine learner with parameter of interest. And this is from this paper, uh, this automatic device machine learning and structural and causal effects. Okay. 
All right. Any regression learner, such as neural nets, random forest and lasso can be used for the regression. What we do require in the theory is that the product of mean square convergence rates for gamma hat and alpha hat is faster than n to the minus one half. Okay, we're going to be, <coughs> you know, that's the second order term. That's the second order term here in the setting we're going to look at is going to be the product of convergence rates. The products of residuals or differences between gamma hat and gamma naught and alpha hat and alpha naught. And so those, those product of residuals has to go away faster than into the minus one half. We give in the paper convergence rates for this lasso learner alpha hat. So you know we give the alpha hat and then we and then we give the rates that you need to, to verify this condition with the product of the rates. You know, you start with any gamma hat, it has some rate. <laughs> And then uh, we give you an alpha hat and the associated rate that you can use to get asymptotic normality. Okay. And then um, we also, in the paper, we give a learner of alpha and large sample theory for parameters that depend non linearly on regressions, as well as parameters that depend linearly on a regression. I'm going to focus in the talk mostly on the linear. Uh, it's a little more complicated if it depends non-linearly on, non on the regression, but you can you can still um, get alpha automatically. In that case, I'll get alpha automatically. Okay. Um, all right. Then we'll also we give an application estimating the treatment effect on the treated of job training from the national supported work demonstrated. Demonstration. Okay, and so this is a follow on on uh, Bob Delon's um, influential paper on this. Um, and so we'll apply these uh, automatic debiased machine learning methods to that application. We, for different sets of covariates, we find similar estimates based on neural net random forest and lasso regressions with automatic bias corrections for each. And we also give an application to estimating price elasticities from scanner panel data. Okay, so in, in the US, they, and I, I know in other places too, they do surveys of, or they actually collect data when you leave the grocery store, right? They collect data about purchases, and there's a nice panel data set of this in the US. And we give an application to estimating price elasticities from scanner panel, panel data while allowing for endogeneity of prices. We estimate elasticities from the auto debiased machine learner of an average derivative that includes many covariates that account for individual specific slopes. So you're including these, these are kind of panel corrections for endogeneity of the slope, actually. And then what we find is we find price elasticities that are smaller than cross-section elasticities, consistent with and um, larger than sort of fixed effects type estimates we found in other work. And we also find the plug-in estimates are very different. So again, the bottom line is going to be, um, uh, one of the bottom lines of this is going to be plug-in is bad. <laughs> and we find that here. Um, the plug-in estimates um, look similar to the cross-section elasticities. They don't take account for the endogeneity of prices and expenditure. And so debiasing is important in this application. All right. Okay, so this paper, again, you know, focusing a little bit more on a seminar style presentation. This paper is a revised version of a 2018 paper that gave this automatic lasso learner uh, convergence rates for it allowed for any regression and uh, any re any regression learner neural net random forest lasso and did this for both nonlinear and linear functions of the regression so the point of that is it's a forthcoming paper but it's been around since spring of 2018 uh, different and it's different from earlier work on debiased machine learning, including what we've talked about so far, uh, like Farrell's paper, which I mentioned, it's different than that. It's different than the double debiased literature. 
uh, paper, the Chimetex journal paper. It's different than ATM bins and water, and it's different in not requiring an explicit form for alpha. Okay, so, and um, it's different also, you don't need an inverse propensity score. So you're gonna, you're not gonna need that. We're gonna estimate alpha as a linear combination of functions actually. Okay, so the contributions, you know, so what is, uh, what is uh, innovative about this paper? Well, firstly, we do auto DML for many effects of interest. This applies to many things. We developed this lasso learner of alpha hat. So this automatic feature is developed here. We give convergence rates for that. And the regression learner can be anything. Most of the previous literature is about specific kind of first steps, like the Farrell paper is logit lasso. This one's quite general. Uh, the you know the uh, double D bias paper ATM Benz and Bogger is about a particular kind of estimator of the average treatment effect on the treated. Um, you know here uh, the first step can be anything, okay, and we also allow for nonlinear functions of regression. So in terms of the causal literature, you know uh, this allows for um, various kinds of causal models that are actually nonlinear regressions, causal estimators. Okay, so that's just a, a kind of a, what you would do normally in a talk, right? You would say what's innovative about the paper. Okay. Okay, any questions? Okay, it's okay. That's, I just put in a blank page to stop me for a second. Okay, so here's the setting of the paper. This is a, now a general framework. We're transitioning from looking at, you know, regression, average treatment effect, to now a general setup. It's going to include both of those examples and many more. Okay, so the data, we're going to look at IAD data, continue to look at IAD data. The object of interest is going to be this parameter. It's just a scalar, a number, and it's going to be equal to the expectation of a function m of a data observation <clears throat> and of a regression. Okay, so uh, this is going to be the parameter of interest that we're going to look at the general parameter. This um, can this m can depend on the whole function. Okay, an example would be gamma of one and z minus gamma zero z. That's one example of an m, and we'll do other examples, okay? And uh, the gamma itself will be a regression function. So the m is a function of a function, something sometimes called a functional, okay? And the parameter of interest is an expectation of, of this m. So you can think of this as just kind of a general way to look at a parameter that depends on a regression function. It depends on uh, the regression function through the way it enters in M here, okay? So it's a fairly general class of things. It's gonna include examples. You know, the one coefficient of a regression, it's also going to include um, the average treatment effect, okay? Now we're gonna focus on the case for this talk most of the talk where M is linear in this gamma. All right. And again, that's going to include the one coefficient of regression and it's going to include the, the average treatment effect and other things. Um, the average treatment effect on the treated can be thought of this way. Um, there's uh, this average derivative that we're going to talk about can be thought about this way. And so there's many other things that have this feature. The paper does cover the nonlinear and gamma case, actually, and how to do the same things when it's nonlinear and gamma. We're just going to focus on the linear case because it's uh, quite a bit simpler. Okay, so a key feature of, of this setup that we're going to exploit and use, we're going to impose and then exploit and use is that there, we're gonna assume that there is an unknown function alpha naught of X, such that for all gamma with finite second moment, 
The expectation of M of W and gamma can be written as the expected outer product of this alpha naught with gamma. Okay, so this, this M here is a linear function of gamma. So this expectation is a linear function of gamma. And so what this is saying that as gamma varies, there's one fixed alpha naught such that this a linear function of gamma can be written as an expected product of this function uh, of x with gamma. Okay, so the force of this assumption is this, this is, holds for one alpha naught, but for all gamma. Okay, for all gamma with finite second moment, the expectation of m w gamma can be written as expectation of alpha naught times gamma. Now that actually comes from something in functional analysis. We're not going to use anything except the name, which it's called a re we're going to call it a res representative. Okay. Um, okay, so this is an assumption we're making. Um, it's not a very strong assumption if you want something that's really inconsistent. In fact, it's necessary in order for this theta naught to be root and consistently estimable, such an alpha naught has to exist. The theory of that's you know, way beyond what we can get to today, but, but it is true that um, you know, making this assumption that this alpha naught exists is, um, is not restrictive at all if what you want is your theta naught to be root and consistently estimable, to have an asymptotically normal root and consistent estimate of theta naught. We're not assuming anything extra in saying that you have this alpha naught. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, I'm going to now do three examples of this and what alpha naught is in each one. Okay. I'm going to do three examples of this and what alpha naught is in each one. And so you can see how this works. Okay. All right. So, the first example is example one, the regression coefficient, okay? So in this example, X is D and Z, and we're looking at regressions which have this form where D enters linearly, the regression, and then you have an additive term that depends on the Zs, that can depend on the Zs in any way at all, okay? Now there's actually multiple ways to think about what uh, how to get theta naught from this regression. One simple way is just put in D equals one and D equals zero and subtract, right? At D equals one, you get theta naught plus H naught. At D equals zero, you just get H naught. So if you subtract at D equals one from D equals zero, you get theta. Okay, so that's a simple thing. In fact, M here is just the difference of the two regressions at one and zero. And you can actually think about it any D and any other D here and divide by the difference and you get the same result, okay? Okay, so that is how you get theta from a regression, very simple. You just difference, right? Difference the regression at some D and some other D and divide by the difference, okay? And then the, uh, the, uh, the, the additive term drops out when you difference the two regression values, okay? And you just get theta, okay? This has an alpha naught, and it is our old friend that does the parceling out. Actually, it's the old parceling out friend. If you look, uh, the expectation of M of W gamma is, okay, the theta, if you will, the theta here in this partially linear or, uh, you know, additive linear specification, the theta, the way you recover it from the regression is you multiply by alpha naught, okay, which partials out. It gets rid of the regressors. You multiply by alpha naught and then take the expectation and this delivers theta. If you plug any function of the form, theta d plus h of z into for gamma here, you get theta back from taking the expectation of this object. 
times gamma. Okay, so that's the reason we're presented here. Okay, that's the alpha naught. And it's entirely what it's entirely what you might have something related to, you know, parceling out. <laughs> you're just parceling out the cover it's out of D. And then that, and then you multiply that by the regression, take the expectation that you get there. Okay. Now note that in order for this to be well defined, first of all, you have to have the denominator right finite, otherwise it wouldn't be well defined, and also it has to be positive. Okay. That is the fundamental condition for root end consistent estimation of theta in this kind of a regression setup. Okay, it's from known from uh, early work on semi parametric efficiency bounds that that um, this thing, you know, intuitively, when you get rid of everything in D that's related to Z, you have to have something left over. Otherwise, you would have perfect multicollinearity between here. All this says is that there's not perfect multicollinearity between functions of Z and D. That's all that says. Okay. And it's required for read and consistent estimation. And you get that showing up as the reason we're presenting. Okay. Example two is the average treatment effect. In this example, X is uh, DZ and gamma naught um, is just um, any, you know, is anything now. We're not restricting this to be, have this um, linear and D form. Uh, okay. Um, and D is the treatment indicator. The object of interest that we derived last time, the formula for the average treatment effect that we derived is this. And we restating that result, if potential outcomes are mean independent of treatment, D, conditional on covariate Z, then theta naught is the average treatment effect. And this is from Rosenbaum and Rubin, 1983. Here, M of W gamma is gamma one Z minus gamma zero Z, right? There it is. That's the M right there. We're interested in theta naught, which is the expectation of M at gamma naught. And that's what you put in gamma naught here. You just get this, take the expectation that gives a parameter. So M is just this. And we showed last time that in fact, alpha naught is the Rees representer. It satisfies this condition. Expectation of M W gamma is expectation of alpha naught gamma. When alpha naught is this. Oh, I'm sorry, that should be P0. Apologize for that. This should be P0 to maintain the notation. Okay. It's the ratio of the treatment indicator to the propensity score minus one minus the treatment indicator over one minus the propensity score. That's our alpha naught. As in other examples, this having finite second moment is required for finite semi parametric variance bound. And that's the condition for the ATT to have a finite semi parametric variance bound. That the, if this is the condition which corresponds to this expectation of gamma naught squared less than infinity. It's just this less than infinity. Okay. And let's do a new example. Okay. A new example we haven't covered yet. Okay, we're going to look at an average derivative, a weighted average derivative. Okay, so now we're still going to, we're going to do the same kind of uh, thing here where we take x and we divide it into covariates and a variable of interest. Well, now the variable of interest is going to be continuously distributed because we're going to be taking a derivative of the regression function. Okay, so gamma naught again is now gamma naught D and Z, but now D is continuous. A D is a continuous random variable. Okay, so the, the point of that is we can think of differentiating this. Okay, W of D is a PDF that we're just going to use as a weight. And what we're going to look at as the parameter of interest is the expectation of the integral 
over this weight of the derivative of gamma naught with respect to B. So it's kind of the average effect of D on the regression, okay? Where we're integrating over just the argument D, okay? And that's the object we're interested in. So now let me talk about this for a minute. So uh, we'll get to the rest of this in just a second, but let me just talk about this for a minute. Notice here what you're doing is you're integrating over D, right? You're integrating over D. U becomes just a variable of integration. Here's the PDF you're integrating over. And then you're taking the expectation over Z. There's a name for this in the, in the uh, literature on non-parametric endogeneity. When you take the conditional mean, here, and then you integrate over the covariates, that's something called the average structural function. Okay, it's that's the name from the literature on non parametric endogeneity in econometrics. There's another name from the continuous treatment effects literature. This is called the dose response function. Okay, the dose response function is when you, oh, sorry. The dose response function is when you um, integrate over the covariates, okay? You take the expectation of why the outcome given the treatment, continuous treatment in the covariates and you integrate over the covariates. So that's what you have here, the expectation over the covariates. And then we're gonna take a derivative of the dose response and integrate that over some weight. Okay, so that's actually an average treatment effect in the continuous treatment setting. So theta naught can be thought of as either the a weighted derivative of the average structural function or uh, an average treatment effect in the continuous um, treatment setting. Okay, so that's this interpretation of, of this thing. Okay, a convenient uh, way to represent this is to do integration by parts. So here you integrate this by parts and uh, you get this representation. This is the expectation of an integral over S of this function S of U, which is gonna be the location score, the negative of the location score for the density times the regression function. Okay, and then integrate it over the weight, and again, the expectation across the z's. So you can represent this as the expectation now over u, where u has this density here, and z, where z is just the distribution of z in the data. Okay, so um, one way to think about this, our, our, our average, and derivative of the structural average structural function here or our average treatment effect for continuous treatment here is written as the expectation of s of u a known function w is known times the regression function uh, where u is has this density as its density w is its density okay and z is just the data and the reason we do this is because you don't want to have to differentiate a machine learner. <laughs> okay, that's the convenience for it for machine learning. Um, uh, it is estimating something that's interesting. It's estimating the average treatment effect, a kind of at weighted average treatment effect for continuous treatment. Okay. Or you can think of it in the context of the non-parametric endogeneity literature as the an average derivative of the average structural function. Okay. So maybe a good time to pause. How are the weights chosen? Yeah, good question. Um, you can choose. The idea would be to choose them uh, to uh, look at the region of treatment where you're interested. To look at how treatment affects um, uh, 
the outcome over a range when the treatment's continuous. Um, w of U is your choice, actually, subject to we need some regularity conditions on it. Um, we, we're looking at bounded support and um, and what else? Bounded support and uh, and smoothness of it. Um, but it's your choice. It's kind of you, you pick the W to weight the region that you're interested in. So what how would you choose it? You uh, you know, um, the uniform weight won't work because it's not differentiable, but you could use some the epinetch to cough type weight, you know, the you could use that or um, uh, something that goes to zero. We haven't thought about it a lot, actually. Because it's so general, you can pick it however you want. <laughs> but the idea is to pick it uh, to weight the region that you're interested in. You want to know the average treatment effect over some region. OK. Um, now, OK, this integration by parts trick turns it into this. And that means that the way to think about this is the parameter of interest is gotten by taking a simulation draw. <laughs> You draw one observation u from this density w, omega, right? And then you evaluate the regression of that density draw and at the observed covariance and then multiply by this score, this negative score, okay? And uh, so that's, that's the interpretation of this. This is the parameter, okay? The parameter is the expectation of this negative density score times the regression, where you're plugging in a simulation draw from this density, okay, and um, plugging in the data for the Z. And that estimates an average treatment effect for continuous treatment, or you can think of it as an average derivative of the average structural function in the correct integrity. Okay. Okay, so it has this form that we saw. It's so there's the what's the M? Uh, the M is right here. Right here. Sorry, that's the M. You multiply this is a known function, you're multiplying by. And the U that is going in here is the simulation draw from the density. Okay. And to get the these represented is simple. You just you just uh, You've got the marginal, you're integrating over the marginal density of Z here. So you just multiply and divide by the conditional density of B given Z. And I'm sorry, this should be Z here. Multiply and divide by the conditional density. And that gives you the reason representer alpha naught as the negative score SU times the, the weight. Okay, because the weight comes once you multiply by the conditional density, that gives you the you're integrating over the marginal distribution of x, and so you have to pull the weight in here. So it's the score times the weight divided by the conditional density of d given x. And it should be z, sorry. Conditional density of d given z. Okay, so that's the reason represented here. And looking ahead, this is when we're very grateful that we don't need a machine learner of this. We're not going to need a machine learner of this. We're going to give you something that automatically estimates this whole thing, including the one over the density. So we're never going to be doing machine learning to estimate a density. Um, instead, we're doing you know this uh, automatic device. OK, another question. Uh, I don't see another one. Let's see how are we chosen. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Okay, great. Got it. Thanks. All right. Okay, this is beta naught, the average treatment of continuous treatment when potential outcome is mainly dependent of the condition on large dimensional programs. That's just the continuous treatment effect. So okay. So all right. So now let's talk about estimation of what we're going to do here. We need, right, an orthogonal moment function, okay, to do the biased machine learning. So the next thing we do is get write down what the orthogonal moment function is. 
where they are relying on the national manner of down half down and out to estimate the state and that we're now going back to the general setting where we have uh, you know the parameter of interest is the expectation of some function of the regression first step regression can be anything you know that's reinforced last or any other high dimensional method Large sample theory requires the gamma hat convergent mean square at a sufficiently fast rate, as in the paper. Plugging in doesn't work here for any of these things. Um, so, and what we use, and it turns out the orthogonal moment function here, you know, that adds this, uh, you know, the, the bias correction that you add to get the orthogonal moment function. Here's the identifying moment. Function m of w gamma minus theta. That's the identifying moment. The thing that you add is the alpha, the res representer times the residual. Okay, times the regression. Re the res representer times the regression residual is the thing that the biases. Now we we need to explain what alpha is a little bit. It's actually slightly more complicated, and so we want to explain that. Uh, just spend a couple minutes in, on this slide and explain it. Uh, a few minutes. Okay. So we're going to allow restrictions to be imposed on the regression, like the, this uh, this additive form, you know, where you have theta d plus h of z. We're going to want to allow those restrictions. And the way we do that is we assume that whatever machine learner you're using imposes this. Okay, that, that uh, for this case, for trying to get theta the way, in the way we described, we're going to assume that your machine learner imposes this form. And the way that we do that is we, we do this by assuming that gamma hat estimates, uh, meaning you know it's a non-parametric estimator, of uh, gamma naught, which is actually solves a least squares problem, but a restricted least squares problem, uh, where it, it's a minimum best linear predictor for gamma that lives in some linear set of functions. Okay, so this is a little complicated, right? Obviously, a little complicated, but, but uh, just think of it as least squares. You know, it's a kind of a high, you know, high dimensional least squares fits here where, you know, gamma is a linear combination of all of these X's, of all of the X, you know, an infinite number of X's. That fits here. That's one special case of this. Another special case is where you have this partial linear form where you have theta D plus H of Z. Okay. And the reason we do this and the reason we add this complication is because accounting for this, the structure of your estimator helps you get standard errors that are robust to the specification here. Okay, and so that's why we do it. Uh, this is, you're going to end up with standard errors when you're done, uh, where it only depends on the estimator. Standard error is like a white, white, you know, Huber, Huber white, robust standard error. It's robust to the specification of everything. Okay. So that's why we do this. Um, okay, so here's here's the orthogonal moment function then. It's going to be this M of W gamma minus theta. The true alpha knot is actually going to be the projection of the res representer on gamma. Okay. So this is why do we, I know it's kind of, this is complicated, quite a bit more complicated than what we've done before now, but it's extremely useful. Okay, let me give you an example. In example two, we're never gonna have to estimate the inverse propensity score. This alpha bar X is the projection of this thing on gamma. So in a high dimensional setting where you have, take a high dimensional setting, for example, where gamma is a linear combination of a lot of regressors. This is the setting of AP and Benz and Rogers paper, actually. You don't have to estimate the inverse propensity score at all. 
you just have to estimate its regression on all those functions. Okay. And that's the thing that we're going to estimate is this alpha bar, the projection of this alpha naught of the original presenter on. Okay, so it's a you know it's a it's an extra level of things, but it just um, leads to very simple, uh, relatively simple relative to the rest of the literature and methods. Okay. Um, the previous literature, like if you look at AP and Benzenbarger, paper, for example, uh, they do a nice thing. There's also other papers, you know, if you actually look at um, the paper I referred to by Max Farrell, you know, where you put in the inverse propensity score, is actually turns out he's putting in something that's restricted. And so the standard errors aren't right if the model's misspecified. Okay. And there's been a whole little sub literature in statistics about this. We don't deal with any of it. We don't have to, because by working with uh, estimating this alpha bar directly, uh, we take care of that problem. Uh, by construction, the standard errors that you get are robust in the specification here. Okay. So there's like a, a paper by Tan in the Annals of Statistics in 2020 that worried about this, and there's been other work on doubly robust device machine learning that have worried about this. We don't have to worry about it because we're taking account of the possibility of misspecification by specifying exactly what gamma hat estimates. And then we're going to look at the right thing to do the debiasing for that thing that gamma hat's estimating. Okay. All right, so, so where are we? Auto moment function here. The true alpha that we want is this thing. Like for the, in general, it's this projection of alpha naught on this set. And again, you know, that doesn't have a closed form in general, but we don't care <laughs> because we're been estimating it without even knowing what alpha is. Okay. okay, so orthogonal moment function, use any gamma hat that has uh, estimates this thing. And then we're going to tell, we're going to, you know, we give an estimator alpha that does this debiasing. Now, one of the things you let's see, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we're probably okay. You can show directly that this is orthogonal. And here's a simple argument for that. Okay, we have the expectation of M of W gamma is we already said that there's this Vs representer. And then and then by the projection, by um, it, it, this being a projection on gamma, uh, for any gamma in element of this set uh, cap gamma, you have this equality, right? So think of this as the dependent variable. This is the regression. The expectation of the dependent variable times the regressor is the expectation of the regression times the regressor. And so that's what you have here. And plug those formulas in. And then when you compare the um, expectation of this orthogonal moment function with um, at any gamma, we're going to compare this at any theta. And compare it with um, at um, ga any gamma and any alpha, and compare it with the same thing at gamma naught and alpha naught. It turns out, and to save time, I won't go through the each step here, but but what you get for this difference is then the minus expectation of the product of alpha minus alpha bar and gamma minus gamma naught. Okay. So in particular, you can see that the difference of the expected value of the orthogonal moment function at the false gamma and alpha with the true gamma and alpha is quadratic. And in particular, notice that if either gamma is equal to gamma naught or alpha is equal to alpha naught at zero. Okay, and so that's the double robustness shows up in here. And also you can see here, this is going to be kind of the remainder from estimating gamma and alpha. 
you know, uh, the kind of the population remainder from estimating gamma of alpha looks like that. You can see it's quadratic. You can see to get that remainder to go away at root n, you need the product of, you know, the convergence rate for uh, alpha minus alpha bar and gamma minus gamma naught to be faster than root n. And that's going to be the condition for the asymptotic. So this is kind of the key step that leads to the, uh, the primary condition, rate condition you need for the asymptotics is that the product of convergence rates of alpha and gamma is faster than one over root n. Okay, because the remainder between of not knowing gamma and alpha has this quadratic form. Uh, Okay, so that says yes, you have double robustness here. If either one of them is equal to the true value, you get zero. Um, you also see that you have a second order remainder here. Okay, and the virtue of this is it's for this whole class of things, you don't have to do this case by case. You have this for all of these things. Okay, any questions about that? So that's a super higher level of uh, technical level we just did than what we've done so far, but it's extremely useful uh, to, to think about things this way. It gets, uh, um, it gets robust standard errors that are robust to misclassification, and that's great. And it um, also you know, gives a simple, proof of orthogonality and kind of can characterize uh, what you're gonna need for root end consistency too. All right, any questions? This is the page that reminds me to stop the questions. We're doing okay time-wise, I think, actually. Okay. Okay, we're going to use cross fitting like we talked about before. Okay, so we're going to talk not now we're going to give the estimator. Okay, so we use cross fitting where the estimator averages over different observations and use to form gamma hat and alpha hat. And we repeat why we did that. It avoids Donsker conditions, stochastic continuity conditions, which machine learners don't satisfy and eliminates overfitting bias. For estimating the parameter of interest. Again, the same notation reviews let IL denote a partition of the observation index set into L distinct subsets of about equal size. L equal five is what we typically do in small samples, we do L equals 10. And then let gamma hat L and alpha hat L be estimators constructed from observations that are not in IL. And then here's the estimator, right? You just plug in the gamma hat here, and then we're gonna give you the estimator of alpha hat, and you plug that in, and that's your estimator. This is a debiased machine learning estimator of this theta hat, I mean, of the theta naught. This is the debiased machine learning estimator. We'll give you this in just a minute, okay? And then the standard error, the estimated variance for Sorry, root n times um, yep, wrong direction. Root n times theta hat minus theta naught will be uh, the estimated standard error is just this. And again, you know, you can uh, because of the orthogonal moment conditions, you could ignore the estimation of gamma hat and alpha hat here and um, get the standard error in the obvious way. It's really just you know. <laughs> It's the sample variance of this thing. You know, you've taken theta hat by taking a sample average of something. You just take the sample variance of that something, and that gives you uh, the standard error, or the, the, sorry, the asymptotic variance estimate, okay? All right, okay, so that's the estimator. There we go, theta hat, estimated asymptotic variance there. Any regression learning can be used here as long as it means for a convergence rate is a power of one over n. You need that. Um, 
of course, it has to be less than a half, but it's got to be a power of one over n to um, be able to apply our rate results for alpha hat. Okay. And these convergence rates are already available for neural nets just recently, just in the last two years, they've become available. They're even more recently available for uh, random forests. Okay. And for lasso, they've been available for a long time from uh, when the lasso rate was first derived, to the best of my knowledge, by Dick Olikoff and Sivakov. Okay. Okay. So now we're left, to, we're down to, you know, how do we get alpha? Okay. So that's not what we're going to talk about here. And we're going to give you like a promise. We've been promising an automatic method of doing this. Okay. So chat. We split the sample and calculate ET. Um, Let's just look at that. Yeah, why don't we look at that? That's a great question. Is that, do we split the sample and calculate? Is that the equivalent thing? The answer is, I think yes, but let me just check and see. Oops, sorry. Close the chat for just a minute. Okay, you take this, right? Yes. <laughs> yes is the answer. So you do the debiased, machine learning on each subsample, right? On each of these L subsamples, where, you know, if it's say five-fold, on each one-fifth of the sample, you'll get gamma hat and alpha hat from the other four-fifths, 80% of the sample. And then plug in and then do this over the, yes, absolutely. That would be right. That would be a debiased machine learner from that subsample, absolutely. And then you just average those across the subsamples, and that would produce this thing. I haven't written it out that way, but that's exactly right. Yeah, and that that comes from you're able to interpret it that way because theta comes outside, right, of the moment function. If theta didn't come outside, you'd have to you'd have to get moments which are like that, and then solve the moments for theta, right? But yes, absolutely. So let's just go back to theta. We split the sample and calculate average treatment effect in each sample and then average across the, all the samples to get the average treatment effect. Yep. Yep. Does clustering have any role here? Okay, that's a great question. We have assumed. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, actually. Uh, you could think about doing this cluster by, you know, cluster by cluster, right? And, um, and that's a good way to do it, to take account of clustering. If you, if you take the groups, it's the splits to be the clusters, that works, okay? And you would definitely want to use clustered standard errors. Okay, rather than the, the ones the V hat we get. So great question. If you pick the different groups to be clusters and do this, this is fine. Now, uh, we don't have that in this paper. It's actually done by others. Um, who are, I, I'll, let me, I'll think of their name in a little bit, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, but there is a nice paper on this, on how to do this with clustering. And that's a good way to describe what they do. They actually allow for a more general form of clustering. But um, that's a good way to describe what they do. Okay. Okay, so we're still, still waiting for alpha hat. <laughs> so now we're going to tell you how to do alpha hat. Okay. So to describe alpha hat, let B be some dictionary or basis of functions X where P can be large. So this is going to be a lasso kind of thing. So P can be large here. And again, each BJ of X is standardized. That means zero and standard deviation one. Okay. Now we require each BJ of X to be an element of gamma for each J. So whatever your regression function is that you're estimating, partially linear or whatever, 
bj has to be an element of that okay and linear combinations of b can approximate any element of gamma as p grows so we think about this as a basis of functions for whatever our set of regressions is let me pause here and just say this is fantastic for the norm for the usual high dimensional setting okay because there your regressors are specified you know lasso gives you a set of regressors that you're going to work with an infinite dimensional set actually and so we're just picking we're just picking the basis here to be the lasso you know just to be the basis you're using and doing lasso okay the regression for lasso the regression is we're going to regress on a bunch of functions infinite number of them the linear combination of which is where the uh, regression lies linear you know the regression is a linear combination of all these lasso regressors right we're just going to use the same regressors here so like compared to atm benzene vaga okay it's an exact comparison uh, it's exactly the same high dimensional setting you're using exactly the same not only we're going to estimate alpha hat entirely differently <laughs> than they do right or anybody else has done okay so doing the average treatment effect in a high dimensional setting you're golden <laughs> you you you're doing lasso uh in the first step and you're going to base the average treatment effect on that or any other high dimensional specification you automatically have what regressors you use here you just use the same ones you used in lasso okay so you're golden for that. Uh, same for the partially linear setup. Um, I won't go into that because a lot more time than we have, but same, same for estimating one. This is actually produces a debiased lasso. And I'll just say this in case any of you who are listening know this. Um, you know, there's a debiased lasso by Javanard and Montanari published in a couple of different places, a machine learning conference, and there's a very nice Annals of Statistics paper. This procedure we're about to describe produces a debiased anything. <laughs> if you, have a part, you want to estimate one coefficient in a, any machine learning regression estimator, you want to estimate one coefficient, this is the way to do it. Um, okay, and uh, it corresponds to a uh, it's not there for lasso, it's not their debiasing. Uh, it is actually a lasso version. They do kind of a, it's called a Danzig selector debiasing. Uh, we actually do a lasso kind of debiasing. And it applies to any machine learner, what we're doing as well as lasso. Okay. I can't, don't have time to go through that, but, um, and that's a very recent thing. We just figured this out. Just pretty recently, um, but it does, it can be bias anything, um, any coefficient in a, in, in, a, in a high dimensional machine learner. Okay. Um, okay, so what do you do? Well, you got this basis. You then uh, are gonna do a lasso minimum distance learner. You take alpha hat to be a linear combination of these basis functions plus kind of the constant term. So think about this as the constant term here. This row hat is gotten by um, doing, this minimiz doing this minimization. It's a, 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 absolutely a lasso type L1, you know, absolute value penalized objective function. Uh, here is just the second moment matrix uh, for the basis functions. And here, the only other part you need just comes from M. You just plug the basis functions into M and do whatever M does to those basis functions. Okay, and you average that and you plug that in. Okay, and, um, and then you do a lasso. Now, unfortunately there's not, well, we have software for this. <laughs> we have software, write, write me about it or write my co-author who will sing about it. And we'll send you software that does this. Okay. Um, you just give it M. You just give it the thing you're interested in. And, uh, 
and the basis functions and we'll, you know, the software will produce an alpha hat. Okay. So again, let's just go back here one page. Oops. Right. Here, we got an M here. And then the only thing you use for alpha hat is you also use M. Only you plug in the basis functions here. Okay, and you use that to get alpha hat. And so that's the automatic feature of this. Nothing but M used here. Nothing but M and the basis functions used here. Okay. Automatic only uses M without knowing the form of alpha bar. You don't need to know what that funky projection thing is. In fact, it doesn't exist in close form in general. So, okay, so um, we can explain more about this. Let's see, how am I doing on my time? I'm doing okay. So let's explain a little bit more about what this thing is doing. Okay, uh, and to do that, we're gonna drop the cross-fitting notation and just look at um, alpha hat's a linear combination of these basis functions, okay? So again, row, this is what row hat solves. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of ignore the constant term also here, ignore that constant term. And so you solve this thing. Okay, so we kind of talked about this a little bit already. It depends on a trace of basis. You're golden for a high dimension regression, you know, lasso or something else or boosting or something else where you just have a linear combination of these regressors, you just use the same regressors you use to estimate gamma, right? Those are your Bs, so that's easy. For neural nets, random force, and other learners um, with, um, sorry about the notation here, just to ignore the notation, you would use a non-parametric P of X. And we haven't quite developed a good prescription for, for uh, those other things, the neural net. Um, um, you can use uh, gradients. Actually, you can use derivatives of the regression function uh, at, with respect to the parameters. There's a lot of those, but you can use those at kind of uh, the convergence point for the neural net, okay? Those are good things to use, okay? Um, although we haven't done a lot of work on that um, or tried those out yet, uh, but that, those are the natural things to use that are kind of like the regressors in a linear regression, right? What's the equivalent of regressors in a linear regression? It's kind of derivatives of the regression function with respect to parameters. So those are things you could use. And um, um, I'm confident they will work. And we have used, we just specified some functions most of what we've done is uh, lasso type things, and we've just specified some functions here um, that are uh, functions of the X's. Okay. All right. Okay. Choice of penalty. Notice that there's a penalty that shows up. There's a cross validation method you can use. It's given in the appendix of the paper. It's actually just the natural extension of the of the lasso cross validation to this setting. So you can just do cross validation here. There's an analytical method in that appendix, and that tends to um, you know, be a little less uh, lambda, set lambda a little higher, which is probably good. A useful, important feature of lasso is that you get the rate right. Um, this is a uh, yeah. You can, you know, pick R. At least you know what the right rate is for R. I mean, as a practical matter, you actually need some database method to do this, and this gives it to you. Turns a nice feature of lasso is that you get the optimal, optimal. Yeah, you actually trade off bias and variance optimally with a known rate. Yeah, unlike series estimates, which um, you don't have that. And the paper gives mean square convergence rates for this alpha hat minus alpha bar, okay? Um, you know, square root of the mean square, population mean squared error of alpha hat minus alpha bar, we give rates, those rates in the paper. Okay, so here it is again, there's the estimator of the alpha. Row hat is this last minimum distance thing. This is actually based on the representation. 
Okay, so that's the idea is the idea of this objective function is it's it's the it's actually it's the squared error. It's estimating the squared error up to a constant. The squared error of approximating the alpha bar by this m. Okay, and we, so we use the Riesz representation to do that. So this m hat here is what is it? It's estimating the expectation of m at the basis functions. Use the Riesz representation. Use that you know this characteristic of the Riesz representative. That expectation of M at the basis functions is just the expected product of alpha naught times the basis functions, which is then the expected product of alpha bar times the basis functions. Okay. Okay. And 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 then G. Okay, so that's what M estimates, right? That's what that's what M estimates, the expectation of alpha bar times B. And what G hat estimates is the second moment matrix. You're golden for least squares. You've got two times, you've got, you've got the expected cross product between the thing you want and the basis, and you've got the expected second moment of the basis. That's all you need for least squares, right? The expected squared difference, we haven't, yeah, the objective function estimates, literally, this objective function, what it converges to as R goes to zero and N goes to infinity is literally this, the expected squared error from approximating alpha bar by BX prime rho minus this constant. And so subtracting out the constant doesn't matter. So when you minimize this over rho, you're minimizing an estimate of the best approximation of alpha bar by a linear combination of these. Cool. <laughs> we think it's cool. Okay. You're actually estimating the best linear approximation of alpha bar by a linear combination of these. Um, when we run horse races, you know, when we try this out and estimating the average treatment effect, this works a lot better than trying to do a high dimensional propensity score and invert it. Okay, this just works a lot better. Um, um, you know, you're getting rid by, by taking this approach, you're getting rid of having to do any high dimensional estimation of a propensity score or a density and then invert it. Okay, and so that's the virtue of this in practice. It, in all the Monte Carlos we've looked at, you can beat those things pretty handily. Anytime you have a propensity score that's close to zero, which you do in a lot of applications, uh, we think that this is going to be preferred. Okay. I mean, the mic does, it is preferred in the Monte Carlo in terms of producing um, uh, estimates that have smaller variances and standard errors that are better. Okay. So that's uh, that's what this uh, that's the interpretation of this alpha hat. Uh, it's just a linear and basis functions approximation to the to the thing you need for the bias correction. Uh, okay, just to summarize this, automatic and not requiring the form of alpha bar does not require plugging in non-parametric estimates of components of alpha bar. Especially useful for high dimensional gamma hat, where alpha bar is the least squares projection, which doesn't have a closed form anyway. Um, it avoids instability from inverting a learner of a conditional probability or a PDF. Such an inverse is present in all of the treatment effect examples. That's what they're all, you know, quite generally for any policy or counterfactual effects, you're going to have an inverse of that to do the debiasing. Okay. And then, as I said, the standard errors are robust in the specification. And clearly, alpha bar is being correctly estimated. So the orthogonality, orthogonality holds by construction. You don't need assumptions about the form of the propensity score. OK, so that's all these nice features. And it balances. OK, I'm going to skip this. Let's see, am I going to skip this? Yeah, let me just say that there's this. Um, you know, there's a, there's a nice literature in treatment effects on getting, um, on trying to estimate treatment effects by balancing, by making the, uh, 
by uh, looking for weights that um, make the uh, overall average of Q of functions of Z look like the um, average times the uh, inverse times the propensity score actually. No, the inverse propensity score, sorry. And it turns out that this minimum distance lasso thing, it's first order conditions or balancing conditions. Okay. So there's been whole papers written about that. Atheon Benz and Wagner attacked it directly. Um, they attacked it directly by getting uh, balancing weights. Uh, the lasso minimum distance is balancing. That's it's the first order conditions. Conditions are balancing conditions. This remember R is the thing that's getting small going to zero. And so what's happening with this lasso minimum distance is you're doing balancing, where the things you're balancing are the are the uh, conditional means for the basis functions. And for again, you know, for a high dimensional setting, those basis functions, those are just the regressors. So this is doing exactly what Inben's Athean Vaga are doing. It's, uh, uh, well, not exactly, it's not the same estimator, but it's, it's doing balancing on the regressors. And it's doing it by this simple lasso thing, rather than by, uh, which is a nice convex problem, rather than, uh, and smaller dimensional than using all the data. So anyway, so it's, I think it uh, has that nice property for the average treatment effect. Okay. All right. So, uh, any questions about that? We're down to just the application. I'll just spend the last few minutes on the application. Um, leave the theory for the paper. And if anybody wants to ask me about the theory, we can go back to it in the discussion. Okay. Going to do an application to estimate the average treatment effect on the treated. Not going to spend much time on this page. Just want to point out that yes, you can do that. Okay, the average treatment effect on the treated is this. That's what it looks like as a function of the regression function. And you can apply what we did to get the right bias correction for this kind of object. Okay. And that gives you uh, a debiased machine learner of the average treatment effect on the tree. And again, you, we're not going to, you know, we don't have to know what the form of the um, um, bias correction is here, what the form of the alpha is. It's got a form, but we don't have to know it. We just can do the automatic thing. Okay. Okay. So as an empirical application, we use the auto DML of the average treatment effect on the treated to estimate the effect of job training in the national supported work demonstration. We follow Lalonde and Dehiji and Waba who compare the difference in means estimator. So the idea is this was an experiment and Lalonde and Dehiji and Waba uh, asked the question whether you could mimic the results of the experiment using the, uh, getting, you know, the um, conditional independence assumption, whether you could find regressors, Zs, covariates that reproduce the experimental results. Okay, that was kind of the question we looked at whether you could find regressors that reproduce the experimental results um, um, with an average treatment effect type estimator, you know, uh, uh, Rosenbaum and Rubin type uh, uh, exogeneity. So, the, so it's an, it, it actually, the answer was yes, you could. And I think that gave huge impetus, you know, really led to, uh, a lot of the use of average treatment effect in economics. The fact that Dehij and Waba could find regressors <laughs> that mimic the experimental results is uh, powerfully persuasive and leading a lot of people to try using it, these average treatment effect estimators. Okay, so the experimental data consists of treatment and control groups from a field experiment. Quasi-experimental data set consists of the treatment group from a field experiment and a comparison group from an unrelated national survey. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, 
We use sample selection and variable construction in the Hedron, Waba, and Farrell. The outcome Y is uh, earnings in 1978. The treatment D is indicator for participation in job training. And we just consider, you know, pretty mild size P's, but you know, one of them is 344 progressors, uh, including fifth order polynomials and covariates, continuous covariates and many interactions. Okay. So that's the estimates we're gonna look at. And here they are. Let me, um, let me um, expand this so we can see it a little better. Okay, so this is the experimental data. Okay, and this is um, this is for uh, fourteen regressors, thirty regressors. Well, specification one is fourteen regressors, two is. 30 regressors and three is 344, okay? And these are uh, lasso, average treatment effect on the treated, uh, random forest, average treatment effect on the treated, and neural nets, okay? And for the experimental data, doing this, uh, you know, uh, doing this, you get pretty similar answers. You know, the standard error is pretty high, right? It's uh, 12, 12 or 1300 for the lasso estimates. And, um, and so, you know, it doesn't merit very more than the standard error across either of the methods, um, right? Across the methods or within the methods for the different regressions. So the answer I was asked, what the last time, you know, how do you pick P? And uh, lasso, and here it doesn't matter much, right? Uh, it turns out even the, the not very um, high dimensional specifications deliver something that looks about like a pretty high dimensional specification. Um, so here maybe it doesn't matter that much. Um, you wouldn't have known that, of course, unless you were able to do the high dimensional estimation, which we are. and. Uh, and you get these kind of estimates. Now, when you uh, look at what the second table, how are we doing? Let's see, I uh, have a few minutes left. So the second table looks at a different control sample. So these are the treated, same treated. The data is exactly the same for the treated observations, but we use a different control sample and uh, PSID by comparison. And interestingly, you know, you get some different estimates here. It's actually different. Um, so changing the control sample mattered here. And um, I like the one with the most addresses the best, actually. And here they are a little different and they're, they're uh, typically a bit lower, actually. And by maybe more than a standard error, a lot of them. So it does seem that uh, using the different control sample matters here for the estimates. You do get some variation too across the different, as you change the dimension. Neural nets is a little more difficult to specify. I think that's why you see uh, more sensitivity there. Um, you know, um, and also, not just a question of more regressors there. It's, you know, the nonlinearity effect, nonlinear effects could also be important here. Anyway, you do get some variation in the neural nets estimate. Okay, when we go one more sample, um, you know, we look at CPS comparison and here there's 185 treated and uh, 5,000, um, 5,900 untreated observations. Lasso looks a little funky, actually, there. Um, um, it's a little different than the others. The others look about like, these are more like the treated, this, this looks more like the, uh, when you just use the experimental results, okay? You get uh, similar estimates to the experimental results using the uh, random forests and the uh, neural nets, okay? Lasso is a little bit different. Um, Anyway, you got you got similar results here for the others. Okay, so that's our empirical results. You find that uh, machine learning for the experimental data 
which has a small sample. So you would expect what happens is lasso probably knocks out a lot of the variables. But when you allow more of these variables in, you get some more differences with the different data sets um, between the lower dimension and the high dimensions. Okay, so what's happening, I think, like when you look here, is putting in more matters here for lasso. And that's probably to do with the fact that lasso is allowing <laughs> because uh, you have bigger data for the untreated, you have much more data for the untreated observations. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so that's one example. And then lastly, let's do the let's do the panel elasticities. Okay, let's look at that. Um, right. So back to screen. Right. Okay. So what we do here is we look at a specification where y is the outcome variable is the share purchased of the good. And we have uh, a demand model, which is just there's uh, 15 goods. You put in the prices for those 15 goods and the total expenditure on the, the set of goods together. And we allow for coefficients in this demand specification, which can be correlated. The coefficients themselves can be correlated with the axis. Uh, to take care of that here, we use a specification, oops, sorry, like this, uh, like um, we specify a kind of the kind of thing that Jeff Woldridge does a lot. We specify a, a correlated random effects where these coefficients, uh, when you regress them on the axis, they have coefficients that uh, can be non-zero. So these coefficients can be correlated with the x's. And we set up the h tildes to be these other um, variables, okay? And so here the high dimensional setting comes from putting in controls for the panel type controls for the endogeneity of B. Okay, B is allowed to be correlated with x here, the coefficients are. Okay, so why might you get that? Well, you could think of uh, prices being correlated with um, uh, preferences because of search or for other reasons. Uh, we're using group prices here. So actually it's a price index. So the price index itself can be correlated with preferences because people are choosing different, different qualities of the same kind of good, like milk. In particular, milk, you might expect to find some correlation in the price with preferences, the price that people pay for milk, because some people would like natural milk, you know. Um, in the US, anyway, there's a separate uh, price for that that's quite a bit higher for homegrown. I forget what the right, <laughs> I forget what the right term is, but for milk that's um, um, uh, comes from cows that don't use uh, a lot of um, extra things like um, medicine and so on. Okay, that's you pay extra prices for that. Okay, and so that's maybe one reason for price endogeneity for milk. Okay, so um, 1,483 households from the Houston area, um, 15 groups of goods. Um, there's the list there. And how many regressors? 1,521, okay? We, we pick uh, B of XIT to be the following fourth order polynomial of log expenditure and of log price for, and up to fourth order interactions. Um, okay, and you get 1,521 regressors. And then we do, um, uh, and then we look at own price elasticities. Okay, and here's what you get. Auto DML, here's what you get. Minus 0.64 for milk, for sodas minus 0.57, pretty small standard error. And if you don't do the bias correction, you get much higher values. And in fact, these look a lot like the cross-section elasticities. So the elasticities that correct for endogeneity via machine learning, when you do the debiasing, you get very different estimates. When you uh, just do cross-section and don't correct for 
um, the endogeneity, you get about the same thing as if you don't do the debiasing. You do the machine learning, but don't do the debiasing. So the bottom line is in this application, the debiasing matters a lot, as does doing the panel estimates. And you know, there's evidence, strong evidence here that prices as uh, people pay for milk are endogenous, they're related to preferences, and for soda as well, actually. Um, okay, and so that's what we find large differences between panel elasticities of these groups of goods and um, the cross section elasticities, and also large differences uh, when you debias. It matters a lot to debias. Okay, so um, that's it. And um, we could do this. Let me just summarize. We have uh, debiased machine learning. We've given a, a, a how to do that for a wide range of interesting policy effects and structural parameters where debiased machine learning was not previously available. It's based on a lasso minimum distance learner of alpha with convergence rates given in the paper. You can use any regression learner, neural nets, random forest lasso. We, in the paper, we do nonlinear functionals of multiple regressions, and the debias and inference is model free, robust in the specification, and single step. Um, okay, and so for um, anyway, so that's what this paper does, and uh, and uh, and shows how this. Uh, uh, there was a wonderful comment. Uh, by somebody or question said, this seems pretty simple. I don't know if it still does, <laughs> thanks to this Reese Representer stuff, but what you actually do is quite simple. You just take whatever the thing you're estimating and um, use that to debias whatever machine learner you're using. Okay, and, um, and that's what is in this paper. Okay, that's all I have. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Professor Noy, for this fantastic task. And now we have a couple of minutes or one minute for if someone has any question. Is there any question? If there is. May I ask a small thing, Professor? Yeah, yeah, yeah sort of. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So I, was, I just want to say so. Uh, so is this paper uh, a more generalization of the previous paper that you presented or sort of if we know this method, is it necessary to know the previous methods? Uh, good question. For regression, yes. Yeah, for regression, if you have a regression machine learner, use this. Absolutely. I think it replace, it's going to replace that. Um, the one thing is, you know, this uh, partialing out thing we do, <laughs> we did uh, to estimate the regression coefficient. That's still a good thing to do. And maybe that's a, a, to replace it by this, you would do the, the Javanada Montanari debiasing thing. And I don't know whether that will replace partialing out in econometrics. Right. Okay. But for anything else, the average treatment effect, absolutely do this. Don't, in, don't do a high dimensional. <laughs> I would not. Well, we have available, so you don't have to ever do a, a high dimensional propensity score and invert it. <laughs> you never have to do that anymore. Okay. So, yeah. So we would, I, you know, and all the money probably we've done so far, this type of approach ends up being preferable in the cases we've looked at too previous approaches. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Is there another question or we wrap up the session? So thank you so much, Professor Nui. Yeah, so and this uh, breakout session is at 10.15. So those who wants to interact with Professor Nui, so may join that session. I'm just... Yeah, so thank you so much, Professor Nui for these fantastic talks. Thanks, Thanks for so inviting me. And I'm gonna just stay on, online here. I'll come back in a few minutes. I'll step out and I'll be back in a few minutes. Yeah. I'll talk to anybody who'd like to talk. Uh, sorry, uh, Professor Nimi, the link for the breakout Oh, session. the link's different. That's right. Okay, yeah, that's I'll right. go to the link. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, okay. I forgot that. That's good.
Yeah. So, Sumendra, is there any other announcements? Uh, no, that's it for now. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, yeah. All right. Thanks.